Good morning, everyone. I'd like to bring this the meeting back to order. Uh, at this time, Tia, would you please take roll? Yeah. Pamela Slug? Here. Ron Seller? Here. I'm going to stop you there. Uh, Mr. McPartland, is he with us on Zoom? No. no. Okay. Keep an eye. Okay. He should be. Thank you. Sorry. Wade. Uh, Deanna Riddle. He's on her way. Brand Thornton. Here. Alex Lovely. Russell Fett. Here. David Vick. Here. Sean McDiamond. Here. Here. Jason Odenberg. Here. Sammy Hayback. Here. Bob Levitt. Here. Hey, Bob. Uh, Rivera. Here. Dave Henneman. Here. Ellen Thompson. Here. Hey, Dave Arantia. Here. Sandra Brennan. Here. Haley Burke. Tara Carter. Here. Donnie Nelson. Here. Paul Anderson? Here. Jay Beesmeyer? Here. Bart Davis? Here. Lori Lock? Here. And myself, T. Wonder. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Before we proceed, I would like to just do a shout out to our newly elected uh, executive director in the back of the room, Mr. Tim Thank you all right, we will now go we'll return to the financials. Please go to page 27. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Beesmeyer. Okay, everybody. You're like me and sleep all that well. And you turn to page 27 and that now. Uh, we went over uh, just current financials through March 8th. Um, just a, a note in case you're wondering. We had state basketball this past month. Seems like a long time ago. Really glad. Anyway, we had it split up. We were at uh, Thomas and Mac for all the 5A meetings. So, how many games did we play in the 5A for state basketball? Um, at, at those sites, uh, we had the semis and, and on Friday, so four games, two girls, two boys, and then we had the two finals on Saturday, I mean on Friday. And then the gate for that, if you looked on your little event by event winner report, you can see that the gate for the games at UNLV were approximately $28,000. Uh, we had state basketball in Reno, 1A, 2A, 3A, and 4A at two different venues in, in the Reno area, Lawler and uh, the Virginia Street Gym, which turned out to be a great venue um, for, for, for those kids and fans. I mean, it was just totally unique, and uh, Donnie did a great job of getting us in there, and you know, our staff was you know, helping us out, navigate that building, and try to you know, find ways to put teams in there. And uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, unfortunately, I, th I think uh, what it ended up with the uh, kid from Needles getting seriously hurt. Um, just before walking out of the gym, found a loose basketball when he tried to dunk and broke his leg. <laughs> And this is after the trainers have left and the ambulance have left. And, you know, I mean, you just never know what's going to happen. That's kind of the beauty of high school sports. You never know what's around the corner. Um, anyway, great job by everybody there. Uh, and the gate for that, you, you know, you would 
be able to navigate this spreadsheet of mine. Uh, you can see the games at Lawler on, on Wednesday at a $30,000 date. The games on Thursday at Lawler. Um, uh, I love reading cyclers. Uh, anyway, all that information is there. I think the gate was about 60000 for those two days. So, you know, we were in the 80s for state basketball. So anyway, all that information is there to peruse, you know, all the flag football events that we had and uh, all the playoff games, period. Listed one by one. And like I said, in that right-hand column, we're still collecting cash. Uh, the amount of cash that we're collecting is definitely decreased. Um, you know, as people get more comfortable using the hometown ticketing. And, you know, we still have schools. Uh, we got to work on schools not doing the proper process of checking people in. Uh, we have some schools that didn't scan one ticket for their event. Um, so, you know, our, our scan rate is about in the 80 percentile, 85 percentile, it should be 90 uh, if everybody's doing it correctly. So we get, you know, we're going to constantly have new people doing that. There is a you know, small learning curve, not, not much. Um, you know, as Annie, you should even call me one day. Hey, yeah, what's the same time we're at? <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah, it was, you know, I'm trying to get the phone call on things. <laughs> With no help from me, I mean, they just figured it out. We just figured it out. Anyway, your current financials are what was presented um, yesterday. I had more chips. Any questions? I, Jen, I have a question. Um, I, I just going back to the 24 25 officials fee. If we could, after the conversation we had yesterday with uh, Swim and uh, Track, if we could have those included and sent to yeah. because uh, I know I'm talking money all the time, but um, <laughs> that's you. Yeah. yeah. So maybe by the time I leave, I'll have track and swimming piece figured out. You know, in mean, my in my all my years, it's just it's been kind of a you know a hit and miss trying to figure out what everybody's doing there. And um, you know, I mean, the fact is, you know, what things were operating differently in the South for track for many years. The North just came on board a couple of years ago, so they're getting their feet wet as far as an officials association still. And swimming just operates differently. Kathy operates differently than uh, the people in the north. So, you know, the, the fact that there is a, a difference between the two, you know, probably not a good thing, but it hasn't been a bad thing. So I've just been dealing with it and trying to keep our officials happy and uh, make sure that they get paid. Um, so we'll do that. And uh, the mileage rate, uh, Ellen did find that the mileage rate went to 67, so you can adjust that on that sheet on page 42 as well. 67 cents a mile. Gas seems to be going back up again. Um, any other questions? I think you see the of all you need either way. Okay. All right. You gotta to have to put the amendment that you know updating the, the fee schedule like right? what Pam just said and update the mileage that they can improve it. And that's on page 42. You're talking about multiple points. Yeah, so if you want me to mention that, right, I go on uh, ABC. Okay, with that said, we're looking for a motion for A for the current financials. Wade? Wade Paulson, Region 3. I need to approve the <clears throat> current financials that is presented by Jeff. Thank you. So, no. So, no, with a second. Okay. Any further discussion, comments, questions in regards to A, the current financials? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Say nay. The ayes have it. Tia, the walking. 
Yeah, I just went over the the 23, 24 winter event recap. There weren't any questions on that, so I guess we can have a motion for that. Wayne Folsom, Region 3, I move to approve the 2023-2024 winter event recap. Tony? Yeah. Second, thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Approved, thank you, you guys have. In regards to number C, updated officials schedule, as we stated, we would need a motion that included the addition of the swim and track feet and modernization. Wait, Wait, Wilson, Region 3. I move to approve the updated official speed schedule and uh, swimming diving schedule. Tony, second. Thank you very much. Any further questions, discussions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Approve the ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. All right. I don't have a time. <laughs> well, Jay, I started reading these things at 10 35 and 10 36. I was asleep. <laughs> All right. Funny group of people. We're going to go back. We are going to go back to page one, uh, item number 17 on page 102. We will finish up with our uh, liaison reports. Okay, we're going to start with the superintendent, Mr. Beth. Uh, thank you. Sorry, we played yesterday and had a board meeting one day, so that's why I was looking for the uh, honestly, from our mass group, we've been pretty quiet from the front of student activity. Uh, continue to just appreciate the work to, that everybody has put in. Uh, thought that winter sports went well, the state of events. Uh, the biggest conversation that came at the superintendent level was around uh, wrestling and the fact that uh, our, our schools and districts received a lot of uh, questions around why we were in Arizona for a state championship. It's, this board was very well aware that that was a conversation, uh, but it, but but I was hit by multiple suits asking, and then as this board has been having a conversation around state event sites, uh, that proceeded with a few of our counterparts really questioning around um, how this board is handling putting um, state event sites together. And so uh, I have spent at the last two superintendent meetings times relaying the conversations this board has been in and uh, discussed the fact that I believe it was our last meeting that I don't even expect quite a bit of time going through all the different sites we've been back and what led to these, um, to those things. And so we can relay that we are doing our due diligence. Um, and try and get into those science and balance and economics and those things. But those conversations are hitting, um, hitting our level and things in there. Outside of that, we're in the process of preparing for the legislative session that is a year out from us. Um, tremendous amounts of, of meetings have been around that. So student activities <coughs> definitely more of a back burner. So other than that, just continue to do the good work that you're doing. And keep keep us in the loop. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the Nevada Athletic Director Association. Xavier. Thank you, Pam. Uh, first and foremost, I uh, want to say that we had a fantastic conference uh, here a few weeks ago. Uh, we had the opportunity to honor uh, both Donnie and Jay uh, for their years of service for the NIAA. And, and thank you so much for all that you've done for. NIAA and, and for NADA as well. Um, we, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't be where we are uh, without both you being in the positions that you are. So uh, kudos and thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Donnie, Pam, Ron, Paul, and Kevin as they uh, presented at, at, our, at our conference. It was a, a fantastic job. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Jason Ogard. He was, uh, if we can give him a quick round of applause, he's actually here. 
Commander the gentleman that uh, is very deserving that of honor and award. So we're so thankful to have Jason as part of our uh, executive board as well. So uh, kudos, Jason. Thank you. And then uh, Ryan Sims, he was our uh, state board of merit from uh, Reed High School, very uh, deserving. He's taken the most uh, leadership courses uh, in the state of Nevada, and he just continues to work hard. And uh, he's working on getting his CMAA and uh, definitely doing some good work over at Reed High School. So uh, definitely some positive things. I just want to say thank you publicly to uh, a couple people in this room, Jason, uh, Sean, Tim, uh, being part of the executive uh, board and, and helping take Nader to another level. We also have Dallas, who's going to be taking over for Matt Melotis for certification. So uh, those that are seeking to get their certified athletic administrative uh, credential, they'll go through Dallas. Um, he's got some big shoes to fill, and uh, we've we passed him with uh, getting a few people certified uh as uh, as we move forward so uh, good stuff and uh, we had about 115 people attend uh, our recent uh, conference so we'll continue to grow a lot of positive feedback and uh, i think the number one feedback that i really appreciate is that nato is ascending uh, we're not to the top of the mountain yet we're going to continue to grow and get better uh at the end of the year 2024 we will have a national conference in austin texas in december in 2025 we'll be back in vegas locations could be determined but uh, we plan to have our conference February 20th through February 22nd. And last but not least, just want to share out with this group, uh, as we shared out at the conference, is that Clark Kent School District did approve for administrators who have a certified master athletic administrative certificate that they will be able to get a $2,500 stipend, which is per sensitive. Uh, so that's a, a pretty big deal. I know that uh, Washoe's uh, trying to figure out the the terminology that needs to be done, so it's done in Washoe. Um, and I know Wes, we're kind of looking at it on your end as well. And I think Knight County was trying to figure out some things. So uh, it's definitely a, a positive thing. And for it to be per sensitive on um, I think we're going to get some administrators that will start taking some courses and uh, get their CMA. Right, Tammy? Yes. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Sloan. That should actually be a requirement to be a part of this board. Oh. I'm just saying. Just. Love now you. that I have a region too, <laughs> <laughs> I think anyone in that public should have at least a CAA. All right, thank you very much. We will go to the Nevada Officials Association. Ellen. Uh, Ellen Townsend, Officials Liaison. Uh, you got your report as a little flyer. It wasn't in the actual packet, so hopefully everybody's got that. Um, some areas that continue to still be on the forefront for the Officials Association are are the compensation, again, retention, recruitment, trying to keep officials, um, and sportsmanship. Um, under compensation, I'm not going to really go into the first bullet because you're going to hear about that this morning uh, regarding football. Uh, I do know that mm -hmm. the NOA, you know, is in support of, <clears throat> of what they are doing. I know Soccer in the North had said that they, they supported them um, but they support them only if, across the board. All the officials get the same fee, so they don't want to see any, any kind of disparity there. Um, moving along to, and I'm not going to go swim and dive and track and field. We already hit those yesterday, so there's no point in, in uh, rehashing that. Uh, recruitment and retention, you know, it's still a concern of shortage of officials based in on the geographical area or the sport. Uh, SNOA has been pretty lucky. They have a partnership with uh, College of Southern Nevada which has greatly increased their numbers down here. Um, but all the associations, including SNOA, experience that loss of officials uh, with the experience factor. You know, someone who's been doing it 25 years versus the new one coming in that has no experience. So uh, everyone is experiencing that kind of kind of loss. Um, and then the ages, average age of the officials in each association is, continues to climb. Um, any NOA struggles with recruiting members. That's the Eastern Organization. Wrestling in the North has struggled a little bit. Um, they had a lot of some additional mat, uh, meets and with the addition of girls wrestling, which they love. That just kind of caused them to have concern over trying to recruit new people. Um, some of the associations are still experiencing like delays in getting their free bills, you know, their, their payments from schools. Um, soccer, volleyball, the fall, basketball experience, delinquent payments. Um, Northern baseball, softball uh, told me that the California Lake schools, you know, haven't paid their pre bill, which was sent out in January. So that just can compound the um, 
these delays in efforts to recruit and retain officials. You know, they, they start to look at that, you know, we're not getting paid. Um, on a good note, the Raiders are going to work with the SNOA, uh, hosting an open house May 16th at the Raiders practice facility. And they're going to advertise that to the community to include high school students. This is a really good opportunity to recruit some, some newer officials with the assistance of that organization. Basketball in the North, of course, they had about 26 new officials, and those officials look to be returning. And, you know, they anticipate, you know, increased growth. So those are some, some good highlights there. The uh, Officials Appreciation Week held in the winter. Uh, wasn't quite as successful as it was in the fall, um, possibly due to the fact that maybe it was a little bit later in the season, so some schools couldn't participate. Um, wrestling had a little trouble. They are limited on their number of meets. Um, so uh, Vince and I and Mark Jacoby, we've already looked at <clears throat> weeks for next year, and we're we're targeting those at more midweek, so that should give a bit, you know, schools plenty of time to kind of react and put whatever they need to get together. And then, you know, we're looking to have the assistance of, you know, the various league presidents here, private charter school liaisons, um, to kind of assist and maybe push that out with some reminders along with the NIAA office, maybe a couple of weeks before the week that we're going to be giving the appreciation, send out just a reminder email of that sort of thing. <clears throat> Issues involving bad fan behavior, you know, potential injurious behavior by spectators continue to be an issue. Not just unruly spectators towards officials, but you know, we're seeing spectators and parents come out of the stands, confronting opposing players, you know, mayhem kind of existing in some cases and others, you know, they're stopped when once they get on the court. Um, soccer, this was alluded to, I think Donnie mentioned this in regarding our sportsmanship committee meeting about proposing a, a change to the soccer ejection policy where that policy you know just aims to reduce the number of ejections but still penalizing sand up you know the send-offs and ejections accordingly you know so so doing that a few other notes um northern basketball really supports the addition of the shot clock they're a little bit concerned about the training component how that's going to occur you know will schools and associations supply that shot clock operator um it's assumed that the SNOA would supply this person uh, in the South and coordinate training with schools in the South, but as far as the North and the East, you know, they're just, you know, how the training's going to work. I know that will all work out. There'll be people involved and, and uh, they'll get their questions answered on that. Um, the SNOA is proposed to having like one master schedule for the South for all levels and all schools, uh, including not just the school district, but private and charter schools. From my understanding, it's it's pretty difficult for signers to keep track of all the multiple schedules if there's not one master, especially with all the changes. So right now, it's my understanding, as you know, reported by the SNOA, that CCSD has a standard schedule with 5A, 4A, and 3A schools, as well as 2A and 1A schools in there. Um, this would just greatly benefit the assigners. It might also help in other areas as well. Early in February, I went to an Arbor conference in Salt Lake City, and they provided an update on their increased cybersecurity measures taken to protect, protect all the users, and officials, and all the schools that are using that. And uh, they're going to relaunch uh, a, few, a future, in the future here, an improved Arbor mobile app, which will really benefit a lot of the officials. They also gave an overview of what they call Arbor 360. Um, very comprehensive platform included all sorts of things uh, relative to you know tracking eligibility. It sounds to me like it's possibly something that's in competition with the combined activate final forms merging. So they have that out there that you know, they may try to pitch to um, the new athletic, uh, the new executive director here and at, at schools. So it's pretty interesting. And if anybody's interested, I can send their little presentation deck to Tia, and you're, you're welcome to look at that. A um, couple last couple things to wind up, baseball, softball, the North, uh, and the East, you know, got the winter, the winter still happening in the spring, so have had cancellations, but most of those have been rescheduled. 
um, some rescheduling in the north has has do, has had to happen due to lack of transportation in various school districts. <clears throat> Wrestling wrapped up. They said an outstanding state tournament from the official standpoint. They thought it was a great place to host um, because that all the, you know all the tournaments could be right there in the one world. sort of official standpoint. That went off really well for them. And wrestling also is pretty excited about, you know, adding girls participating in wrestling. And uh, Mike Sheets had said, you know, he said it was just really, truly incredible to, to see all that events. Um, one other thing just to add for Arbiter, you know, there's athletic directors here I know and, and officials, we had a new account representative and they really increased their customer service. And, you know, I was able to handle something here yesterday. So, um, that's a pretty good highlight for, for Arbor as far as their increased customer service. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I will. I am next. Just a couple of things. I know a lot of you on the board have received some email alerts. At no time will I ever ask you for money or oh, yeah. gift cards. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's it's happened it. to Rollins, but feel free when you get those to see my way. But, uh, you do know those are scams, so but that is that's been going on for years. So please report those to whomever you need to. Please do that. I just want to uh, just mirror what some other individuals have said about NATO. Thank you, Xavier. I know Rollins and I had a great time along with Donnie and um, in speaking as well, doing some sharing. And I really hope that continues um, because I think people need to see that we have one relationship. It's not. The divide of the north and the south so again that was outstanding how uh, you orchestrated that your staff that you put together well done well done uh next thing i want to talk a little bit about postseason i do want to talk about wrestling um i i personally was very disappointed in the fact that we weren't able to find a facility in the south that we ended up in arizona and because it was last minute, in my opinion, and again, this is my opinion, and the fact that we had to go to Arizona, I'm gonna talk about finances again, that was an unexpected impact on my budget, where I had I ended up getting 125 hotel rooms, uh, five charter buses, and I paid for per diem. So that had a huge impact on my budget. And for those of you that don't work for the pool systems at the level in which all of them work at, we can't just, I can't go tomorrow and go to my boss, who then goes to upper leadership, and, and I say, hey, Dr. Martin, I need another $75,000. It's not that easy. That in itself could take months. And there's a lot of paperwork, and it goes through different levels. So I really want the NIAA and the board to be conscious when we start talking about money, the, the track, the increase there, <laughs> that I have to go back and start crunching numbers. Um, I don't have a problem if, like Mr. Jackson brought up yesterday about the Tahoe Center. I don't have a problem with the Tahoe Center. That's going to impact him because now he's taking his kids out of the Reno area. As long as I know in advance and can plan. You know, I, it's a beautiful facility. <laughs> it's beautiful. And if they could accommodate, why not? But it's that pre-planning that really um, just hurts all of us around this table, especially those of us that plan travel as well. So please keep that in mind, uh, staff, and NIAA staff, as we go forward. Uh, I also need, and this is a conversation, I guess, I don't know if I need to have with staff, is that... I'm going to use wrestling, for example. By a Monday of the tournament, schools, districts, when we plan travel, we have to submit our, our itinerary to the charter company. We have to submit our rooms to the hotels. In a lot of cases, there's not a lot of wiggle room. Now, this is an issue when we're taking up teams. It's not a problem at all because they already know the numbers. They already know the, the rooms. However, as that week progresses, we have, kid, we have kids pulling out of the tournament. No, I don't want to go. Kid got injured. So we start throwing in some alternates. And I need 
at Bart Davis and whomever over this because this this is this impacts track too because I know track is up north is that we can't keep adding kids Wednesday, Thursday, because A, I pack as many people as I can on these charter buses. And number two, it's seldom that I can get extra rooms. So I really need you, the NIAA, to take a look at that and see if you can shorten that deadline. I can do a Tuesday max, two day, Monday, Tuesday, cut it off because they typically travel on a Thursday. But we got in a situation where it was a day of travel, a kid pulled out and, a, and an alternate was put in and the parent was upset because we couldn't accommodate the kid. The coach got upset, but they don't understand the logistics behind. So please take a, take a look at that if you would. <clears throat> we talked about the future of golf. I'm going to ask the NIAA, and I should probably bring this up when we talk about tournaments, that it was troublesome that we had a second day 12 o'clock tee off. That, that still burns me. Because we didn't finish a state tournament and we had to get kids home that were going across state. I really believe it's time that we take a look at a second day qualifier. We don't need kids finishing a tournament shooting 220, 230, 240, 250. That's happening. Professional golf, qualifying standards, second day, we should have the best of the best. Just think about a bracket, just like bracket tournaments, okay? So I would like, and I'm going to ask the NIAA to get a committee together of golf coaches, athletic administrators, athletic directors, and have this conversation. Because as we transition to fall, with the possibility of the NIAA having to pay for tee times, because courses aren't given free anymore, I think that needs to be a consideration. I think that's big. I, I really believe that needs to be looked at. The next thing I have is, I want to go back to the last two liaison reports. Domingo has requested a parent educational guidance and training for schools. That needs, that is important, and that's an ask that he is he has brought forth twice. And I'm going to tell you that when you work for Clark County, Washoe, we do things internally. Those trainings take place internally, as we do in our office and within our district. The NIAA board members, those that you may or may not know, but the charter schools and the private schools are basically overseen by the NIAA staff. So I would ask the NIAA to pursue that request from Domingo. Um, Ellen, you may mention that Clark County has a schedule with 584838. Let me do some clarification for that. That's not Clark County School District. Tim Jackson happens to be the scheduler for the SAP to include all schools in the 5A, all schools in the 4A, all schools in the 3A. So it's Domingo, Jason, everyone around here, Dave's responsibility to have their schedule part of that. Okay. And I think that's where the confusion gets sometimes. It's, that's not, we're the creator of it. Clark County School District, however, Tim Jackson, but it includes everybody. So just so you know, it's just, it's not, it's not just our creation for our schools, it's for the entire room. And it is outstanding, even though Xavier, <laughs> never mind, won't go there. <laughs> so I just want to know. And lastly, as we did when um, Donnie transitioned into the executive director position, Rollins and I met with Donnie. We plan to do the same thing with Mr. Jackson and this time to include Mr. Anderson so that will take place. And I'm gonna be upfront and honest. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Jackson for a 90 day plan. And I think that's important. I think we need to start his new term with goals and objectives. And he's one to take the bull by the horn. And I know he will do that. So, all right, I am finished. Thank you very much. All right, now. Okay, Donnie Nelson. Thank you. Donnie from the staff. Uh, four brief verbal mentions. 
We sure, sweet. Uh, first of all, Mr. Ampium, best wishes moving NATO forward. I know you've got a great vision of how that's going to be. Um, I know you can't define that vision yet because of facilities and dates and what all surrounds everything with regards to state basketball. But uh, what I saw and what, what you developed this past conference and, and all those thoughts that you shared that are spinning through your mind about where we go from here, it could be something wonderful. And you're the right person to do it. So the best wishes to you moving forward with that. Uh, second message, Mr. Jackson, these the mentions uh, B and C revolve around you, and and these are these are positive things. But just to make sure they're on your radar right away, right? I, I know you're going to have a a litany of uh, <laughs> of things to accomplish in, in a short period of time. First one is uh, the SNOA commissioner position. That that is something that uh, because I wanted to make sure that whoever was hired as next executive director can formulate that position in. His image, in this case, will be your image. Uh, the SNOA did share a recommendation on uh, their preferred option, and that was to be naming sport by sport commissioners. Uh, I have a copy of that. I would be more than happy to hand it to you because I've got a saved electronic copy. So that may be one direction you go. Another direction you go may go is you may just want to replace Mr. Ratner directly, the single person. A third option you may want to go, which has been discussed within the the other leadership organizations of officials is that possibly it's a it's a, a three person type of situation. And everybody does a sport or two each season, right? So you've got an open book into that. Uh, again, I'll be happy to share this with you. And, and I know that in due time, you'll certainly meet with uh, Mr. Ratner and Mr. Kostasik and, and the Eskimo board as to what they're English. But again, you know, I'll hand this to you. Okay. Second thing, uh, Mr. Jackson. Again, uh, a positive thing. The Section 7-8 conference coming up this mid-September is in Whitefish, Montana. Uh, I will forward you that information about conference registration, tell you what about the Section 7-8 conference is all about. That's a fall conference. Uh, knowing that between now and that mid-September 2024 conference in Montana, the Nevada Association will host a 2025 conference. And now, you'll have the ability to decide if that conference is going to be in Las Vegas or in Reno. Uh, certainly, you'll have to help work on a site securing that. Uh, I will share with you all the details about hotel rooms needed, about a, a, an itinerary of how that meeting goes, some of the duties that are involved with hosting that. Uh, you know, Jay and I have been involved in hosting two of those previously over our career. So, again, item number C, I'll share with you about Section 7 8 conference hosting that in 2025. Okay, coming up. And then the last thing uh, with regards to uh, Mr. Beck, just step down. Yeah, you got to call me. Okay, I understand. Uh, just a note to everybody that I will be meeting with the superintendents on May 2nd. Uh, one of the agenda items on May 2nd, meeting with superintendents will be in regards to SB80, and that is the concussion management program. Uh, right now, our two of our, uh, excuse me, three of our SMAC committee members, uh, Dr. Murray, Dr. Scott, and Jeremy Haas, are in the process of creating the rollout of SB80. Uh, we will address that rollout in a SMAC committee meeting that will be to be scheduled for mid-April. Once we've got that rollout plan established, and I know that those three are working on that daily together, then uh, the SMAC will, will figure out what that rollout is, we'll do it, but I'll share with the superintendents on May 2nd at their meeting, and then from there, once we get this lesson, the superintendents, they all understand how the rollout of the concussion management protocols go, then we'll be back and share with the board on, on June 5th, and the schools will be notified sometime between, the schools and districts notified sometime between mid-April and June 5th on how that rollout is going to go. So, uh, I don't think it'll be cumbersome. I think it'll be straightforward in the way it's designed. So, anyway, that's uh, those are the four items I've got. For us to thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it starts again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Just because we're in the lays out before, I mentioned this yesterday, but I just wanted to like go out and make a request. Um, for us to explore an uh, NASC liaison on this board, not just uh, the students. I know that are, do that representation as well, but I'm wondering if we could uh, have a like a formal liaison position for that. I think just we would start. Yeah, that we are going to change the names. Please, I uh, thought so I said, Mr. Not thank you for that. So that would require a change to the bad administrative code that is specified as to how many board members need on the representative team. So I, mean, I, I can share that regulation with you if you'd like. Yeah. You can propose the regulation change and have to scratch it out, you know, blue, red line, etc. So it has to go through the LCD process. Okay. But I can share that with you. Thank you. I was not aware. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, so let's please go to page 62. Item number 13, the increase to the fee for football officials. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Don Nelson from the staff. Uh, Ms. Townsend, you are going to intro this. We do have Mark Jacoby uh, representing the NNFOA, or the Football Officials Association. I know we'll have a couple of speakers as well with public comment to that. Uh, Ms. Townsend, would, would, would you like to come? We'll just do an intro briefly about. Why we're here with this, or uh, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Jacoby for his presentation. Sure, that's okay. Thank you. Ellen Townsend, with the liaison. Um, what you're going to hear before you is uh, back in uh, last year, the Northern Nevada Football Officials Association notified the NIAA, uh, the board, Mr. Nelson, I think it was in June. That they were going to be opting out of the current member of member schools association agreement, um, effective come this July 2024. Uh, they honored all their games in the fall this this past fall, and then come March of this year, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, they sent a request to Mr. Nelson, which I think went out to the board members as well, um, stipulating what the requests were, uh, basically. Their requests are to increase the varsity fee to $95, effective this July, increase the JV Frosh fee uh, game to $75. Um, they, they are looking to charge a scrimmage fee of $250 for those schools that you know want a three-hour scrimmage. Uh, they're looking also to reduce the game length for the first game of a double header. Um, it's my understanding. And I could be wrong, but uh, in the South, that is already in play. Um, and then their last one was to increase the number of officials for 1A games from four to five, adding a back to it. Um, the president of the NFOA is Mr. Mark Jacoby, and he provided a cost analysis of an estimate about how much this separate proposal for the fees would cost and, and the scrimmage would cost each of the school, school district on a statewide basis. I think we can go into that. You know, he can explain anything else, add it, whatever he'd like. I think he's on Zoom, correct? Yeah, th thank you, Ms. Townsend. And I know from the staff that uh, Mr. Jacob, before we bring you on, board members, liaisons, uh, just so you know, pages 63 through 65, that is a letter. I know you've all seen that, the introduction from Mr. Jacob explaining what this item is about. Pages 66 through sure got right, 71 in your board packet. That is the cost analysis provided by Mr. Jacoby, and this is from the NFOA. Uh, and, and I realize this, this, this item is a statewide item. Please remember that this item is a discussion item for today. It is not an action item. The public comments in your packet uh, with, with one insert go from pages 72 through page 94. So, President Summit, if I'm correct in then, I think I've set the table for Mr. Jacoby to join us, and uh, I believe it'll be a, a five-minute presentation since it's on behalf of the group, that will be permitted. Uh, so, you good? Okay. All right, if we would uh, allow Mr. Jacoby to come around. Oh, there he is. I see him. Jacoby, welcome, sir. We've got to go ahead and present it to you. You're ready to go five minutes, please. Thank you. Th thank you. Uh, um, Board of Control, I'd like to just th thank you for this opportunity to to meet with you this morning on this uh, proposal. I sent this letter in back uh, a couple uh, few months ago, back in October, and the basically of this is I want you to keep in mind this is football is different. Okay, football is different, and the aspect is we're not better; it's just different. The time spent at a football game is different. Um, people say that. Well, we, we're all equal. You know, everybody gets paid the same. Well, if you paid everybody the same, if you bought, dial it down, football makes $16.33 an hour. Ms. Sloan, Mr. Stallworth, if you really wanted to save a, a lot of money, pay everybody the same, $16.33. You'd save over half a million dollars just in basketball and volleyball alone. Um, you have to understand that this is a, a critical point for football. Um, I'm not here making threats. I'm not here. I'm just representing the 89 people 
in my association, the men and women who do football. You know, this is not a surprise. We, you know, we we wanted to renegotiate the contract, and we know that it takes all associations pertaining to the Silver State Association of officials. So we we understand all that. And we're not trying to interrupt the, the student athlete experience. So this past year, we covered every single game we made obligations to. Uh, we want to be that good partner to the NIAA and to your schools. But football is different. The time spent is different. And basketball, you can do two games and make the same amount of money you do in one football game in less time. Uh, we have youth leagues up here that pay $75 and $80 a game. And their games only last an hour and a half. You can do two youth games and make twice and sometimes three times as much as you make for a freshman JV game. So we're struggling keeping our membership. We're struggling gaining membership. And you have to understand is football is not better. We're not saying we're better than basketball. We're saying we're different. And basketball is physical, physical intense, running up and down the court. The keys basically are the same. But football Keys are different. We're covering 120 yards, 22 players. Every place, 87% of all plays end with a collision. There's injuries. And, you know, time of games take forever sometimes. Last year with lightning strikes, we had 36 lightning delays. I don't know the last time I was in a basketball gym where we had a lightning delay. So, I mean, you have to take things into consideration. Basketball, other sports are different. You know, we calculated a four-hour time span because we do have some running clocks. We do have some games that get out of out of hand. But we also have some games that last five and a half hours. So they averaged out to that, that four-hour period that we put in our recommendation. Now, basketball has done great, a great job. They make scrimmages an option. We could do, too. We could make scrimmages an option. It's not a, it's not a drop-dead thing for us getting paid for scrimmages. We can make an option. It's just that when we travel – two hours to, to Churchill County to do a scrimmage at our own expense. It, it, it's kind of costly. Or we travel up to Truckee to do a scrimmage at our own cost that we're required to get covered. So, I mean, those are the things that uh, we need to keep in mind. And then the last thing is like the, the 5A, uh, I mean, excuse me, the 1A, I mean, we, we are the same age. We're getting older. The kids are the same age every year, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. The kids are the same age every year. The officials in our association, our average age is 55 years old. We're getting older. The kids stay the same. We're trying to recruit new people in, and we're not getting them. They'd rather go do fall basketball, youth basketball, where they make $47 a game for doing uh, you know, junior high basketball. And they can do two games, three games in a day instead of coming out and doing a JV football game. We're struggling getting officials. Now, I can't speak for SNOA, which I was an official there for seven years. Not one time in the seven years that I worked there that I ever get paid mileage. We're here. We pay our guys mileage, our gals mileage. So, I mean, I, I know that there's differences across the state. There shouldn't be. The contract states this. Somebody says, well, you shouldn't get paid to go to work. Well, it's not. We're an independent contractor. I, I don't get paid to go to my regular job with the Boys and Girls Club, which I've been at for 37 and a half years. But I, I do get covered as an independent contractor to drive to, to Churchill County or if I drove out to Pahrump or whatever. Um, the bottom line is we need this increase to be taken serious. We're at a critical point, and I'm encouraging the, the Board of Control, the Ms. Sloan, Mr. Starworth, to take this into consideration that I'm not here looking to get paid like California. We're not California. I think our request is very modest. Most states use football as the gear. They pay football, and then they start lowering the fees for basketball, baseball. Most states around us, the 10 surrounding states, the western states, do that. So I, I hope that you understand that we're not here just trying to pat our pockets. The, there's not very many opportunities during the year to get games like in basketball. There's not very many opportunities for our newer officials to recoup the the cost of getting involved. Okay, there's not that many opportunities, but the opportunities we do have, we need to take advantage of them to make our association stronger so we can continue to give to that student athlete experience. I, I hope everybody understands where we're at. 
This is That's a perfect. critical time. Thank you, Mr. Scully. Perfect time to end. Thank you. And obviously we'll have you stay on uh, in case any questions or comments come, come back to you. So to, to clarify for the board, uh, page 60, again, this is the discussion item. Page 66 is the request. And that is that the varsity level contest officials pay $95 per game. The JV and the freshman levels per contest, $75 per game. The breakdown goes to page 66 through 71. Uh, one note on, on the scrimmage, I, I, I believe Mr. Jacoby uh, knows this, that uh, we the NASC 385B.436 with regards to interschool scrimmages, uh, that would have to be a regulation change in order for officials to pay for scrimmages. And that's across the board for all sports. So again, that, that's a, that's really a, a separate matter. I, I think Mr. Jacoby understands that. So that part of the request would have to be on a whole otherwise outside of uh, the increase of levels the pay per game per level. So uh, with that, this Townsend, any comments to you? I know we've got a public comment, then we'll get into uh, the possible board discussion. But anything this this Townsend you want to wrap up close to? Um Townsend officials liaison. Um you know I I feel for the football chapter um their competition with the youth football paying a higher rate. Um, you know, that's kind of driving a lot of their officials to go do those games versus versus football. Um, you know, maybe they are do some sort of a, an increase above what the other officials make. Um, I'm not sure that's this fee. Um, you know, maybe it's something that could be negotiated. Um, I have a concern that, you know, if, if, this fee was granted by this board that other associations would then possibly look to say, well, hey, you know, we, we think we should get this um, and then take that same route that, you know, I, it's my understanding that the Northern football will do and the Northeast football will do, and, and that is not work in the fall. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Kind of concerned about that, but we just see like dominoes start to happen when someone is requesting a fee, maybe not. Um, also, the gap would start to, you know, would start to really increase over the years. And that's another concern because our contract states right now that any raises are a percentage of what state workers get so you could be looking at you know five years down the road this gap is in you know 21 50 or 20 pretty soon it's 30 but it's you know 33 35 um, and then we're back to having a fishery say you know we should get you know all these all the other fishes associations might say we're doing more so i'm not sure how to you know how that would play out well um, my concern is that it is putting our current contract in jeopardy right now this is kind of my concern i know that um vince is probably going to speak on or he will, you know we have to speak on the snoa in your perspective on this um, i think like i stated earlier the we have any noa supporting the nfl the, the, the northern football in total um I'll let Vince speak on, on the Southern Nevada group. Um, Northern soccer would support the fee increase only if it applied to all the other sports across the board. So that kind of negates what Mr. Jacoby is trying to, to get with his officials making some more money. I'm not aware of any other groups supporting um, the football's proposal at this time. I haven't received any information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to go to some more comments and questions, or would you like to go ahead and do the public? We can do public. Then we'll just go ahead and do it. I think we should have paid more time. Board first. Okay. Sorry, Vince. I'm seated. All right. Good exercise there. Thank you. 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 What are we waiting for? I mean, now we're on discussion again. We don't see. I, I need some input here because this, this is two meetings in a row. We're going to come to us. Certainly, Dinos and staff. So the first meeting was public comment. 
And typically in a process after public comment, if there's a flavor or an interest or a recommendation to bring it to the agenda, then it comes for a discussion. And that's what this is here is discussion. Uh, I want to make sure that there's interest in the board to possibly bring it back for action or not. So, so we're in the proper process, right? So you need a motion for action on the next meeting? Is that what you mean? Uh, he, 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 no. what, what are we, I mean, this obviously we're in trouble here. So with these referees, so and I know the increase is pretty significant, but I just, I need some input from you guys on what you think about this before we, because I'm, I feel for these guys, but I also feel a lot of it. Yeah, so, again, so that would be the next step is if, if after we get through here's discussion, if the board wants to bring this forward as a potential action item in the next week. That's just yes. what we're yes. Mr. Grizzles. Sam Donnie, uh, Ron We're going to uh, engage in a conversation among the members of the board. Soon we'll first hear from the public. Typically, on any item that we have, the board discusses a matter and then public comment comes at the end of that discussion, and then there may be additional discussion by the board based on that. So, I mean, that's that's good. I don't know how much board. Yeah, if there's a discussion now, you can wait and then have to decide to come and speak and be engaged in discussion again. That, if you'd like, that's what you have to do. Okay, I just want to make sure that my comments are informed as it possibly can be. And it seems to me that there may be additional information um, from the public. But if we can engage in a conversation after as well, then I'm also sure. Yeah, so this has been a one of the radar information that. Obviously, we've been aware that our superintendent group can do anything to deal with uh, financial impact. We to go to the front of our NAS group um, prior to an action uh, on this board because ultimately uh, we don't want to be put in a situation where our superintendent group would, would have to use our executive authority um, to not support the decision of the board. And so, uh, Tony, if I could ask, irregardless of where this goes, because I believe ultimately we're, we're going to have to have this conversation um, at the superintendent level. I know in brief conversation, the one uh, thing that's been brought up is that over the last three or four years that I've been our rep, um, you have systematically come in and asked our group for support in raising the other fees to all be at the same time. And our superintendent group, as, as you're very well aware, wasn't 100% on board throughout that process and bought into some of the ideas around uh, differentiation between the different sports and some of the things. And you worked, um, and, and myself within that, in the connections. Um, and Ellen was there at the table a couple times that there was a lot of work that went into convincing our group to support pay for varsity officials being, being more equitable across the board. And I know you're going to face a little bit of resistance when you now say that the three years or four years worth of work of trying to get this thing through, uh, I, I know you're going to face a little bit of resistance or at least questioning. Resistance probably is the correct term, but at least questioning um, in why now a group is trying to then go, because we foreshadow that once one gets and the next and the next and the next and the next, then we'll be right back in the same boat. Um, I hear a lot around what the pay is, and I know our group is going to want to see it. I, I don't want to hear it. I, I want to see it. Um, I want to see what Section 6, 7, our neighboring states truly are. I hear we're one of the worst in the nation. I read the public comments that are there. Um, that youth football is making more or the same. Um, we're going to want data at our level so to know uh, that it's it's true, and so we can make an informed decision. And so what I ask is, in preparation to work, this thing is going to keep going because I think we realize we're we're up against the wall. Of, of we need activities to happen. 
we need to be able to make some informed decisions. So uh, I'd ask you, your staff, to work with the Fish Association to put a spreadsheet thing together so we can see what those pay structures truly are. Um, so that so that we know. And then your legalities that go with what the agreement and stuff is between the board and that, that's something you'll have to work on. But as far as the data set that, that we're going to need to see, is we need to truly see that those are actual numbers. So if I could ask you to, to get that next, I know you're coming next meeting um, in May. Um, we just need to communicate that it could be a little longer. That would be my Ellen, Ellen Townsend, official liaison. Um, I know, I think it was last year in July, uh, the NFHS can have conduct, had finally concluded gathering all their information on a officiating um, survey that had to do with fees. Um, it's a pretty detailed Excel spreadsheet. It's got varsity game fees, sub varsity postseason. Um, for almost all the states, and there's some that are that are not on there, and I can forward that to to Tia, and you know she can get that out to the different board members and liaisons, knowing that you know this is a year old, so those fees could be different, but um, you'd have that, and then possibly you know we could look at getting more updated version on on at least the states that are in around our area, you know. Idaho, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Northern California, maybe uh, Oregon, you know, just that the Western group, so to speak, to have some comparison. That's your that's your line, correct? So I, I can work with um, Jay, Tia, whoever we need to, to get that information. Jay. And more discussion before we go to the Um, you know, I've been on this board for eight years now, and I want to say during those eight years, we've had official groups come in and make requests for funds. Um, I think for four out of those eight years, we've increased the funds over the last six or seven years on most of our officials and referees um, in our association. And we always have appreciated the work they've done as a coach. I was a three-sport high school coach with softball, basketball, and football. Uh, I respect these guys immensely. Should they get paid more? Well, yeah, they should. I think we all should get paid. Um, I, I'm a teacher in this state, and we're one of the lowest-paid teachers uh, in the in the country, uh, in the state of Nevada, uh, hopefully that's changing as the years go on. The point I want to make here is is that our budgets are based on funds and and a payment that we we have to pay, and we get that at the start of the year. We have a contract with the officials' association that basically says that we pay them X, Y, and Z for the levels that they participate in, and, and we pay that. Those increases, the, the, the officials association, and, and, and Mark, tell me if I'm wrong, but there is a, they belong to the state association with regards to, by every certain years, there's an automatic increase, what, I think there's a, a cost of living increase in the, in the next couple of years or next years. And I want to say that it's going to be 5% next year. So there's already a built in increase on a yearly to bi yearly, two years, three year process that goes to already providing an increase to the officials. I have to go to my budget people next week with an increase for a lot of different things going on for next year. And now I'm looking here and on my budget now, I'm gonna have to add, add close to 15, $16,000 to uh, a budget. Now that might not sound like a lot, 
But when over the last eight years, I have had to get a 20 to 25 percent increase on my annual budget at the end of the year from the district because of increased payments that we don't have. With that said, I can tell you that over those eight years, and, and uh, the officials might want to will uh, will check me out on this with regards to my accuracy. But we have a process in place where we have a running clock when there's a game that's a blowout, so that shortens the game. Um, we have over the last 10 years, I think we went from a crew of five to six or four to five, something along those lines with football. So that was an additional increase that we have to provide better initiated games with an increased crew. And in the past, and again, I haven't been head football coach since 2010, but it was kind of a common courtesy years ago that the officials would come and work our scrimmages as a, a show of, uh, of uh, camaraderie and, and training and all of that, that they would come and do our, our scrimmages. And, and now it looks like we're, we're, we're wanting to pay for them to come and do our scrimmages because if I give my coach the option, if I told my football program, you have to pay $250 to have officials come and do your scrimmage, or you can do your scrimmage without an official. Football coaches, you can chime in, we're out there, but my guess would be that if they had to pay that out of their own budget, they wouldn't have officials at their scrimmages. So I, I think we have a process in place. We currently have a contract with the uh, with the association right now for for, um, for next year. Do we have a contract with the association for next year? Yes. Alan, will take it away. Alan Town Officials Liaison. Yes, we do. Um, we, I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday on that the increase uh, was 5% effective this July. And the way those increases work is whatever the legislature um, grants state workers, um, we are entitled to, according to the contract, that percentage up to 5%. Um, and it is one year delay. So if the legislature in uh, last year had said, you know, raises in July are 5%, and in 2024, they're 4%. For our contract purposes, it's delayed a year. So hence in 2024, we would get 5%. Next year, we would get 4%, allowing schools and school districts to know that ahead of time and plan and budget for that. So those are in place. This July, 5%. Uh, July, 2025, a 4% increase, which is pretty substantial. Sure, sure, sure. So yes. and I appreciate that. So we have a request by the association to come up and above and over that fund, fund to, to put in place for next year already. That's what the request is. Correct. And, and, and that drastically impacts my budget with, with, with the increases. And, um, and, and, and I understand their complaints, but I, I think we have to work under the contract that we have and, and, and make things work until we can straighten this out, but but I can tell you what, we're going to open up Pandora's box when an official group comes in and says, we're not going to work if you don't pay us. And I know that I haven't heard him say that. But boy, I sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they're not going to work. I haven't heard of my friend. Not one of them has come up here and said that to me. So with that being said, you know, I think that that, that we, we can't be strong on it, but I, I don't want to be challenged by anyone. But if we do this, every single association and other officials and, and referees and all that are going to come in. And there's no way we can turn them down because we're giving them this. It's my understanding six, seven, eight years ago when I sat in this job, 
these organizations have a built-in grade system set up by the state. That's what we've always kind of worked on. And I'm, 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 I'm talking with, with uh, advice and direction from my superiors in my district. Um, so looking at the increasing, like the 95, so currently the varsity games are making 77.25, that's a 23% increase up to that $95, roughly. AV games, 55.75 currently, it's a rough increase of 34.5% to get to that $75 mark. I feel like there needs to be some negotiation between the board and the association. Um, especially if they are getting that five percent increase from this summer, and then four percent the following week. So our financials are public, and if you look at the line item for football, it's pretty substantial. And I understand that other referees might want to make more money to, uh, you know, because football. You know, we're looking at increasing football. We'll learn how to referee football. Okay. In my business, people who work in certain areas get paid a different wage because of their skill set and what they know and how they know how to do it. So if you just look at the line item at $520,000 okay, for football, it's a big number. And when you say $15,000 compared to that five twenty, dollars that's nothing. I mean, really, when you look at that, so I'm just throwing that out there that, hey, if you want to be, you want to make more money, learn how to referee football, okay? I mean, no offense, but, and I, I didn't have kids that played football. I had all daughters. They played basketball and soccer and anything else, but I'm, that just might be sense. Oh, I'm sorry, Lynn. Um, just a little bit different perspective. Um, so I was an official in the 80s, in the early 90s, and I did basketball, football, and softball. And uh, during that time, uh, it was the same question, um, especially with softball, because city leagues were random, and I could go make more money um, officiating four or five city league games a night versus going to uh, a softball game for girls and doing one high school. Um, basketball was the same way. I could go to the city league and I could go do three, four games in a night doing city league um, basketball rather than going to a JV or a middle school or a high school basketball game. But there was one difference. The difference is, is if you want to become a better official, you want to go do the better games. The youth games are not better games. You're going to make more money. So as an official perspective, if you want to make money, go do the youth games because you're going to make your money there. But if you want to become a better official, you want to go do the better games. I mean... I wanted to go do, I, I remember doing a, a Bishop Gorman Valley High School game by myself because my partner didn't show up. It was 102 to 103 at the end, and I ran my tail off going up and down that floor. Um, I mean, do you want to go do the best games as an official if you want to become a better official? So there has to be some of that. Should we pay more? Well, yeah, we all think they should get paid more. We all think that they should get paid a lot more, but the pay is what it is. And we all have budgets and constraints and the schools are paying for this. I mean, um, yeah, we paid 520,000 for football, but the schools, the individual schools are paying for those officials when it comes down to it, right? I mean, the districts are paying for it. And so um, uh, from a perspective, you're always going to have competition out there 
with youth leagues, with other organizations. Um, and it's easy to go do youth league football. It's easy to go do youth league basketball. And that's fine. So my perspective is if you're an official, because I was an official, if you want to make money, go do the youth league. But if you want to become a better official, and if you want to do the good games and get to the state game, you got to go do the high school games and the better games and want to improve your skill level so that you can make it to that. And that's my two cents. Okay. Vince? Yes, in a way. Thank you. Good morning. I think that's all. It's Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. And Chris President S. No Way. <clears throat> the, the frustration with the football officials. A lot of you guys go to football games <clears throat> and you're there, what, two and a half hours probably to do a game. A lot of people don't realize the preparation that the football officials have compared to other sports. And I work a lot of sports myself. You get to a football game, hour and a half, two hours prior to the game starts. Okay, so we're on site hour and a half to two hours before the game starts. That's required within our group in Vegas, and I'm sure it's required with the other groups in in Nevada. So hour and a half to two hours football game on average, wrong. This is hour two and a half, three hours on average. If it's not a running clock, so we're looking at hour and a half to two hours pre-game, which is necessary, football game, two and a half to three hours on the field. So the other sports, the game is over, we go to our stuff, we walk back to the car ride in 10 minutes. Football game, we go back to the locker room, we post game, we shower, it's another 45 minutes. So if you simply look at the time a football official arrives at the school, Clark County, the games are six o'clock for varsity game on Friday night. We arrive in, in from Edmonton away at about 4 or 4.30. We depart about 9.30 at night. Uh, Betsy Reed was here yesterday talking about track and field officials not being compensated properly for running a six, seven hour track. You look at football officials there at school, I guess in five or six hours sometimes, $73. <laughs> now, I shift gears to basketball, which I work. I can go over three basketball games in four and a half, five hours. Well, I've got people over two hundred dollars. I worked double hitter in baseball last week, three and a half, four hours, hundred forty-seven dollars. Volleyball, now you can do three matches in what four hours? I assume. Ellen Townsend officials liaison. Uh, no. Okay. We we were required to be there. At least 30 minutes on the court. So you're talking 45 minutes, you know, maybe an hour, 45 minutes to get there. We also do a post match debrief that can take a half hour. Depends on the competition. You know, I've been there where JVB match has lasted 45 minutes. I've also been there where it's lasted an hour and a half. Uh, same with varsity. So, you know, that's a minimum probably at least of an hour and a half, hour and 15. And I've been there for two and a half hours on varsity. So, it, it, that depends on the competition. So I do know a volleyball match. You can go do a freshman JV game, walk out in two hours, you make $106. Mm -hmm. Freshman JV, you're not going to include varsity in yeah. that. But the point I'm trying to make is the frustration with the football officials down here, and I assume it's the same in, uh, with Mr. Mr. Jacoby's group, is the amount of time we are at the school pre gaming, working the game post gaming, and they're walking out with $73. Should football be hiring a little bit more sports based on the time? I think we can all agree that they should. Uh, I also know, Miss um, Sloan and Mr. Stallworth, I mean, we've, I've been many times at uh, a seven year spot on this board trying to get raises for all those sports. I mean, that was the goal, right, Jay? Years ago to raise the sports to uh, the same pay scale, which, which you mentioned earlier. That was what, seven, eight years we went through this. I've seen Went to the superintendent's meeting myself trying to get a raise for <clears throat> volleyball and softball a couple years ago. Successful. So we do know this process. We do know the fees are equal across the board. But as Mr. Jacoby said, it's 
football a little bit different based on the time than the other sports? Absolutely it is. Um, yes, in a way, we don't agree on paid scrimmages. We use the scrimmages as an opportunity to train our officials and go out. Without the scrimmages, we're in trouble. We use that for our new officials, veteran officials to evaluate and train our officials. Do we believe we should be paid for scrimmages? And as no way, no, we don't. But based on what Mr. Co Mr. Jacoby saying, the pay for football based on the time the officials are at the school for the time they leave, should it be higher than what it is now? In my opinion, yes, it should. It's strictly on the time. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, it's just uh, all absolutely. Uh, just a quick question. So, as I understand the argument that the football officials are making, that the northern officials are on the side of the, the request is that the base of pay of football be raised among all other sports based on the fact that it's different because it takes more time and you have less opportunities, less less games. It is, Mr. Anderson, I'm glad you brought the point up. Like I said, I work a lot of sports. And yeah, football is what? Thursday and Friday, you know, around the state. You may work one Friday game, you may or may not work Thursday, depending on the availability of the new officials. So the number of games in fo uh, football season uh, is not many compared to the other sports. You work baseball, double headers, baseball, softball, volleyball, three, games, three matches in a day. Multiple sports, you can work multiple games in a day. So, so, but that's the point is, is that you're, you're seeking to raise or the item is seeking a raise with respect to football as a sport as opposed to all other sports from an officiating standpoint, correct? Correct, yes. And it has nothing to do with the fact that you still are going to be looking at the, the raises that are negotiated into the contract based on uh, state cost of living and that sort of thing, correct? Correct, yes. So that gap would increase with respect to all other sports. Mm -hmm. It would. Uh, if we're on the same scale across the board, now when we get a raise, everybody gets the same ranks. Right. I understand if football <clears throat> was successful in getting this large raise, as the raise become the five percent, the four percent, and future raises that gap will get larger. Right. And, and any raise is going to be substantially more than than other raises. Not maybe not substantially, but that is five percent, a hundred is a lot more than five percent to. Right. That is correct, yes. So, this, my question is, is, so they approve this, and what's preventing you from coming back in a year from now and asking for more? That's the issue that you already stated earlier. It took us a long time, right, Jay, to get to get it to the point where all the fees are paid the same. Based strictly on the time, should football be paid more than they should? Based strictly on the time. So you're looking at just football? That the proposal put forth by Mr. Jacoby and the Northern Group is strictly for football. Well. Vince, initially when the Northern Association brought this to the board, it's my understanding that Clark County wasn't involved in that. Your association was not involved in a pay increase. It was just solely Northern Nevada. That is correct. And then when they came to our board and talked to us, our, our communications with them was that this was going to be a discussion item and that they could go ahead and bring it to this board to bring it up. During that time, it's my understanding that they made communications with you guys to get your support on this and make it now more of a two or three county or, or area support. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, our leadership in SNOA had a meeting about a week ago. Most of us officiate football strictly based on the time we devote to football. We were in agreement that football could be paid, could be paid a little bit higher than what it currently is. Okay. And only a few Okay. Thank you. And then with that being said, who mandates that the football official gets to a school an hour and a half before the game? The association does, or does the school district or NIAA? Uh, that, is, that is an association policy across the board. If you were to look at any other state, 
in, across the country, most efficient get their 90 minutes to two hours. And that requires, obviously, we got a lot of safety issues. We got football a little bit different than the other sports. We got to deal with a large, a, a more lengthy uh, pregame and a football game than most of the sports. Like I said, I work other sports. I buy a basketball game in an hour and a half to two hours before a baseball game, absolutely not. We get there typically most sports 30 minutes to an hour before. <laughs> football is typically an hour and a half to two hours. And why? Why Why does football officials get there an hour and a half before a football game? I'm the head varsity football coach. I'm doing pregame and all that with my kids and all that. I know why I need to get there an hour and a half before the game. But tell me why would a football official, all five of you, or six, need to get to a football game an hour and a half before the game? That's a great question. F football has, as we know, a lot of injuries, a lot of officials. We use five of our hours in the game. When we pregame, we go through each position. We go through the mechanics. We know the, we know the rules. We'll touch our rules due to the safety issues. We talk, we go, we go in depth about possible scenarios. We talk about teams' tendencies. We review <clears throat> previous games, the uh, situation from the games. Uh, there's a lot that goes into a, a free game in football that typically we don't use for the other sports. And that takes an hour and a half. Is you well, so the, so we're required to be on the field 30 minutes before if to start our free game duties. That's what I wanted to know. You're required to be on there 30 minutes before. Yep. Your association and the North possibly. Yes. And your association says we need to be there an hour over what the what our contract is paying you for. You want to be there an hour. That is correct. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Uh, Vince, at what point does the travel um, pay kick in? Um, for an official, uh, is there a distance there? Um, I mean, currently it's 67 cents a mile. Um, at what point is it 20 miles, 15 miles, 30 miles, or outside the city limits? How, how does that work? So in Southern Nevada, we get paid mileage only if we leave city limits. So the closest location we would go would be Boulder City, Indian Springs, Sandy Valley. We do get paid travel there. Within town, which doesn't make sense to me. If you live in the southwest part of town and you're going to the east side of town, it's going to probably take you longer than going to Boulder City or Indian Springs with no travel. That's a bigger issue in Southern Nevada is the travel when the rest of the state and school districts pay travel in Southern Nevada only gets travel when we leave city limits. And we know there's there's no quick, quick ways to get in from one side of town to the other with traffic and obviously no travel associated within our city. That is the bigger issue for us, is compensation for travel by the rest of the state receivers. Any other questions about the football? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to uh, Dave Van Hill, uh, Representative Nato, but uh, I don't know. I'm just going to make a couple comments, and it is what it is. Um, you know, the nice thing for us in a way, at least uh, we have no school flag football, so you can kind of work some games right Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Of course, we throw some additional games on the Thursdays and Fridays. And then in the South, we have flag football in the winter, so a lot of school football coaches or officials can also then officiate flag football. So that that is beneficial for uh, for the South for sure. Um, I, I feel uh, bad for Ellen to a degree because I feel every time Ellen comes and speaks to us, it's about <laughs> official increases. <laughs> every single time. And I mean, no respect to you, Ellen, and you're sitting right next to me, I'll probably get hit after this because it's fine joining the club. Ham's already in front of you. Um, but I just, I, I just feel and, and wish that, you know, and, and I don't mean to put this on Vince or Ellen, but something so that all the officials, essentially, all the different entities and groups can all collaborate so that we don't have to have this constant ask every single time. Because here's what I see. And I know Joe Orbendorfer is right here and he does soccer. Well, Joe's going to come and say, well, hey, football just got a raise. Well, in soccer, we run a lot more. 
And, um, you know, there's a lot more collisions because they have more potential concussions in soccer that he's going to say, well, base soccer was just for football, now soccer wants something. Uh, basketball, again, you're going in deep into the paint. There's a lot of stuff going on. Then basketball is going to want something. And then, you know, it's just going to be this snowball effect. And my question is, what are we doing for coaches? We're not talking about coaches increasing pay. And they're also, you know, kind of getting uh, the shaft to, uh, to a degree. Um, I know, Jay, you've been dealing with this a lot. Um, you're probably the expert. We've seen this. Um, I would love to hear your uh, perspective. Um, but I just wish that we could put officials pay to arrest. But I think it's got to be something that's worked together amongst the north, amongst the south, amongst all the different entities so that it can be balanced amongst all groups. That's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you for saying everything in which I was about to say. But I agree with you. I, I agree with the fact that other associations can come forward. We worked so hard as a board to make the pay the same. That conversation was years. And we fought hard. We worked, we put a lot of time in to get the pay scale where it is today. So, yeah, so that's a good conversation. Mr. Nelson? Uh, nice with that. Just need more direction. Where do we go from here? Uh, I have a request from Russell. If you want me to leave that, you go. Well, I'm going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> This is a huge issue. Uh, we talk about eligibility every meeting. We talk about officials. It's, it's really no different. Um, officials are a big part of it. And I'm all for officials getting more money. I think they're underpaid. I've always supported officials all the way through my career. Um, some people believe that, some people don't. But this is, uh, I always say, you know, when you can go reprint the board meeting packet from 10 years ago, and people wouldn't know the difference. Because everything goes around, comes around, it seems like. Um, football officials used to get paid more money. When I started, they, they were at the top of the skip. Uh, for whatever reason, I thought it was a good idea that I'm tired of talking about who has a tougher job, a swimming official or a soccer official or a basketball guy and comparing those sports and what's more difficult. So I went you know, upon my mission to say, okay, let's pay everybody the same. And we finally got there. It took way too long, but we got there. Um, and now we're going back around again. With all officials telling, hey, we deserve more than the other sports because of this or that. And I can't disagree. This wasn't my vision. Um, but right now, um, with the state of the economy, where we are, and the time spent by officials to supplement their income, there are some people who referee, and that's their only job. Um, and God, I have spent my whole career working with officials, trying to have a nice balance between our member schools, the perception of officials amongst our member schools, because I deal with the complaint department in our office. And if it involves officials, it's either Mark or myself or one of the other commissioners hashing that out, going through the particulars of an incident. Um, but I think, uh, you know, for 99% of the time, we respect what our officials do and honor their call if it's within the rules. Uh, even though their delivery may be a little bit off one day, um, but officials are just a huge part of what we do. And you know, if officials in in football, I mean, the dynamics of this situation is the northern group said, we're going to opt out of the contract of all the other sanctioned official associations. If we don't get this, we're going to opt out. 
we have what 12 officials associations sanctioned they want to be out effective next year if, if they don't get a raise uh doesn't involve nobody else has said they're going to opt out you have to give a year's notice they did last year and they said okay within the contract you got to give a year's notice if you can opt out they did that um and now here we are and it's 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 so difficult for me to to say hey you know going against what my philosophy was let's pay everybody the same um and a lot of it was compared to other states i mean if if we went and did a comparison of what Utah's getting paid in Washington, Oregon, whatever, it's it's similar. It, it might be a little less. We've always been kind of catching up in Nevada. Uh, we have 1,420 officials in this state. We had 1,406 last year. So that's not a great increase, even though Vince has, you know, been doing a wonderful job with the SNOA as far as getting the word out and, and it's it's amazing what Vince has done. And I I can't tell you how appreciative I am of what the SNOA gets because it's a huge undertaking. And the officials, they want to get paid. Okay. okay. The travel issue in, the, in Southern Nevada for, for our officials is a huge issue. It's much more huge than this, what we're talking about. Uh, we're not even talking about it right now. But for the for the Southern Nevada officials to not be paid mileage for when they make a, a 80 mile round trip, I can't believe that they have tolerated that for as long as they have. And it's just it doesn't seem fair to me. Number one. So I know we're not talking about that particular issue right now. <laughs> Pam's blood pressure just went up, you know, <laughs> to 150, 60. Four. Um, or, it's David. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm listening to all of this, and I know I'm, I'm leaving in a few months, and Tim Jackson, this becomes your issue to, to deal with for, for years going forward or whoever you get to replace me if, if that's the structure of the office. But I, I have always appreciated and loved our officials. Um, I was one for 20 years. Um, it's 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 not supposed to be about the money. I get it, but in this day and age, times have changed. You go to the store, you get a little bag of groceries for sixty bucks. Um, it, it's just different out there, and I don't think our official speeds have kept up with what inflation is doing. I I would hazard a guess that I'm correct there. Um, and we need to take care of our officials. We need to make sure that they're doing everything they can to bring in new officials. And we don't want to sour them with the fact that, you know what, it's just not worth our time anymore, which is a reason a lot of these people are not officiating right now. They don't have the time and it's not worth the time that they would have to spend. And that's where the youth football thing comes in and, and they're doing that instead. Because frankly, you know what they all say i do this for free well i know you know i know saying is if you do it for free then that's what you're worth nothing <laughs> so i support our officials through and through this is a tough one for me and uh, i just appreciate all 1420 of them. So, thank you let me go to we have another mike Mike Schaefer, please. Mike Schaefer, I'm on the SNOA Board of Control. I'm a four or five sport official over the course of the years, and I've been a member of the association for 45 years. And so I'm listening to the banter back and forth, and uh, there's a couple of things. One of the things is brought to to mind is that football is a Thursday night thing and a Friday night thing. Um, I kind of bleed SNOA blue. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for me to work a lot of different sports in a lot of different areas that are not SNOA, and I'm an SNOA guy. And it's for football, it's Thursday nights and it's Friday nights. And then Saturday mornings, I'll do youth because of the fact that it's give back and help and 
help the younger officials, and for the kids. Uh, if I look at my arbitrary schedule right now, I'm in the middle of softball season. I opted to do softball this year versus just baseball and softball. And I've got games every day this week, and I've got games every day next week for softball. But I don't have that opportunity for football. The other part of football that was brought up is why the pregame? Well, of all the sports that I've done over the years, football is the one where the collisions occur on a regular basis. And we have a team of five. Um, on occasion, there's a seven-man game, but we are scheduled for five officials. And we have to work in unison together as five. And that's why the pregame, because of the quote-unquote violence of the sport of football, we have to be prepared to segment our responsibilities with five officials, and we have to be on the same page. The other part is, and we, you know, we're not even talking about travel, but I, I personally, I do not agree with paying for scrimmages. It is our time to not only learn as a crew to work together, but to give back and help the kids get better as well. So I have to disagree with any idea of paying us to come and work a scrimmage because it's us, our, our opportunity to get better. Also, the, you know, we're not talking about, although you bring up a serious valid point, I think you're from Perron, okay? I determined and I live, um, my office is a block away from Coronado. And my house, I live up, you know, I live up in that area as well. And I determined when I have a game in Perron, it's farther in time for me to get to the edge of town than it is for me to get to your school once I get to the edge of town. So the travel going out of town is a thing that we deal with. Now, next week, I'm going up to see Sean's school. And it's probably an hour for me to get to the northern edge of town. And then, of course, the time it takes to me to get up to Panac. We all drive in this area here. And that's the other thing about football. Football, we work in crews. We work with the same guys every week. We have a crew of X amount of people. And we work with the same guys. And we're scheduled to go across town, and we do that. In basketball, softball, all the other sports that we do, the assigner keeps us in our proximity more times than not. On occasion, we'll go across town. And again, for me to leave my office and go to Shadow Creek, which is an hour and a half, because there's no easy way for me to get to Coronado to Shadow Creek, but it's an hour and a half for me to leave my thing, and there's no mileage. And I'm not here standing here for mileage, but it is an important part of the factor of, that we deal with the traffic. Even coming to here this morning, I had to figure out the best way to come dealing with city traffic to come to here. And we do that on a daily basis, but we didn't use that, do that 20, 25 years ago. But those are the factors that are involved in the preparation involved in the sport of football and the preparation involved in dealing with traffic in this town. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank Well, Scott, Allen Towns and Officials Liaison. Um, board members, you may be asking currently, is the agreement we have in place a good agreement for you and for the officials? Um, I personally think it is because it stipulates how these increases are supposed to work year after year after year. You know, so we're not back at the table all the time asking for, for various <laughs> increases. Um, those one, those increases that have occurred over the last five, six, seven years, um, I think started when I did presented softball and volleyball. I think I had to come back and it took me two years to get those fees in agreement by the board that they would be um, the same as the other fee, other, you know, freshman JV uh, varsity fees. And then we waited a whole nother year before they were even implemented due to budget, you know, due to the timing of it. So, um, I think we have a good agreement in place tied to whatever state workers increases are, um, allowing schools and school districts to budget because they're a year delayed. So that's just my opinion on that. And I think I share 
that opinion with a lot of the other presidents and commissioners uh, in our organization. Well, I have a question. Uh, Ellen, with the associations with all of our officials in the state uh, and, and different sports that we offer, how many times do you guys all get together? The leader of football gets with volleyball, gets with baseball, softball, uh, swimming. Do you guys ever get together one time a year? Oh, all the, all the presidents of the officials associations and all that, you guys all get together ever and sit down and, and, and talk. Uh, yes, Ellen Townsend, officials liaison. Yeah, every year we have a commissioner and president's meeting in June. Um, there are times when not all together, but I know during um, during COVID, you know, I had a lot of Zooms, different Zooms with different groups, with, with our groups to get together because we weren't meeting in the commissioners. There's times when I do Zooms just with different groups. So maybe not all together, but when I do the groups, it's I try to include if it's like I, I had a Zoom with Swim and Dive. So it was Swim and Dive, both organizations, North and South. Um, try to do the same with, with football. We've had, a, we've had a few Zooms with that. As far as everyone together, we do that annually at our commissioner president's meeting. Well, you know, I mean, we're dragging this on. And, 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 and on, and what I'd like to do is come to some kind of a conclusion. And I'm making a suggestion to the board. Uh, this isn't a uh, formal anything other than the fact that um, I think this discussion needs to continue. I think the focus maybe needs to go away from a pay increase but really focus on a possible travel increase in pay for, for officials and focus on that aspect as we have a pay scale in place that's dictated and, and uh, already set up with regards to state increases um, for, for, for state workers and so forth. And that uh, this group, the NILA, organizes a, a, a yearly statewide some kind of a meeting or conference with the, the official leaders of, of all the official organizations to talk about not only their salary and what their pay is, but what would be an equitable mileage aspect that is separate from an actual pay scale that we have and, and, and address that issue. Um, and I think that maybe that, that, that could be where the compromise could come and take place there. I'll leave it at that. Uh, let me just say, I know that we're going a little off topic here. We talk about travel. Vince and I haven't had a conversation in regards, and you can bring it up every meeting. Vince and I haven't talked about pay for travel for two years plus. And CCSD, we have never ever paid from the days of Ray Mathis in this position. And apparently it was agreed upon then that travel would not be paid. Uh, we always rear, it always comes up, comes up, comes up, and uh, you know, I'm to the point that, you know, I, I don't know, just I get really defensive when we start having this conversation because again, Vince and I even had this conversation two and a half years. So all of a sudden people want to come to the board now and bring it up when the association lead isn't even having a conversation with me. So that's something I, I, I just want to, Vince and I need to go back to the table, you know? I, I'm just, I'm frustrated when it, when every time that comes up. All right, uh, but I'm gonna ask the direction here. Yeah, I do need to move on, I, I can know that. Uh, concern around the idea from the travelers, the 67 cents is tied to federal personal convenience uh, or district convenience rate. Um, and so I think going above and beyond what would reverse anybody higher than a federal rate is not well. It's also disproportional to those of us that, I mean, I just got done telling Tia, I'm way more concerned as a rural district in the travel cost. I pay way more in travel fees to officials than I am in their game fees. When they come out version, I pay on average uh, $120 for somebody to come out round trip to from Reno to come out and work that game, and I'm paying them 75 bucks to officiate. And so uh, disproportionality, but more, 
importantly, I think that we have to stay tied to that federal reimbursement. Southern Nevada's conversation in here is a whole different one, uh, but as far as the contract. So just nervous about that. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank you for educating okay. me. Okay. Yeah, Donnell's and the staff. So again, let, let's focus on what this item is, uh, Mr. Peck. The, the, the travel discussion is something else, but I think that's talking about quadrants within Las Vegas Valley. I don't, it's not talking about the, the rate. So I'll make sure I, I think I'm confused. So that, that's a whole different discussion between the association and possibly the district and or schools. So to focus on this side, board members, you have the option to say, Mr. Nelson, bring this back on the agenda for in on June 5th, June 4th, 5th for action item. You could also tell me, Ms. Nelson, visit visit the superintendents, get their input on May 2nd, and the superintendents want to put on the on the agenda as our legislative commission, they could direct you to put it back on the agenda as well. So it could come from the board, it could come from the superintendents, or it could come from nobody. And it doesn't have to be necessarily decided today to come back as an action item, but if the board wants to do it, you should probably should direct me to do that today. Because then, then again, I'll still meet the superintendents on May 2nd. I can still bring this up and get their input as well. So that, that's where we, we got to go forward. I'm with Tony. That's a, that's a weird position to, for this board to be in. Then how do we vote on it? Half of us don't want it to come back. Half do want it to come back. So if one person wants it to come back for action, then it's going to come back for action. Yeah. Then you can vote on it if you want to or don't. Do it next time. Yeah, absolutely. Or we're going to have a principal from a school. Say and I staff will recommend this as a as a board item. And that that's procedure. So we'll send this to some Mr. Anderson, but that's that's kind of where I think you go. It could be a question for you, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> well, I think I think where the board the the where the board needs to be today, this is a discussion item. If the board wants us to come back at an action item, then that direction needs to be given. There can't be a vote if the discussion about right. it. I think it needs more info. That's, I like the super 10 thing. Um, and while I respect what you guys need to do and look at it as well, but also, too, I think these guys need to put together a little bit of proposal. And then also some clause in there, Paul, that we're not discussing this for three years, four years, whatever. It's pretty new story. You come back, we can negotiate it back. Yeah, I don't know. I just, there's nothing that says that they can't come back in a year and say, hey, we need another 25 bucks or another 23% increase or this or that. Or anything. I get it. I'm going to tell you what, in my business, nobody gets a 23% increase. It goes all the way to the CEO of the company. So, you know, I understand the five percent cost of living. You know, we do two percent, and it's a big deal in my business. So, and I, but I get where they're coming from. I respect it, and I think that uh, there needs to be something in in writing. Uh, I just don't know where to go with it. I I respect where you're going, and, and I get it. I just I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Sure, line of promise. The, the the item is about the Northern Nevada football group represented by you know a guy that you know bleeds officiate. March is awesome individual. Um the, this is the item for the NNFOA saying, you know what, this is our proposal, this is what we need, or we're gonna opt out of the contract. So this becomes a Northern Nevada, and it is a Northern Nevada issue what we're talking about right now. It really doesn't involve Vince, you know, they're supportive and Mike got up and spoke. But the issue in the package is for them, the Northern Nevada group. So if they're gonna opt out of the contract, then it becomes, you know, an issue for all the schools that are served by that association, probably 30 schools. Um, and then it expands out when other associations need help. Um, certainly a wrong issue. Um, because if football comes around next year and there are no officials to work, that's a problem. And we've always managed to avoid that situation. There's been a couple of official strikes in my 28 years. Uh, basketball went on strike uh, in the north. 
20 years ago, right? And I kind of first joined. You know, God, what's going on here? It's kind of like what you said yesterday. What's going on here? Um, anyway, it's uh, that's the issue that you know, we're going to bring back as an action item or, you know, or not. I think it needs to be. Um, we have our commissioner's meeting in late May. It's usually the first Friday of June, but that's the 7th, and we have a board meeting on the 5th, I believe, 4th and 5th. So we're going to have our commissioner's meeting the last Friday of May, which is after Memorial Weekend, May 31. Um, and we all get together and we talk about all of this stuff, and it's going to be a live meeting. And I promised in my last one, it's going to be a fun meeting. And Mark will be there, and all the commissioners and presidents, and we're going to hash over these type of issues that we've had during the current year. Um, try to make officiating better, get everybody on the same page, like Rollin wants us to do, and we have to do it, you know, for every year that I've been here. Um, you don't want to talk about officials as a board. Well, too bad. Because it's a big part of what we do. And I, and I get, you know, well, we don't want to come back and ask for raises. And that was the whole point of the contract. And it's been wonderful. It's been a good thing. But here we are. And, and like I said, it, you know, it just kind of goes around in a big circle and now you're back to football saying, hey, we deserve more than the other sports. And I don't do football, but I'm not going to disagree with you. So I, I think, you know, if you're going to decide whether to bring it back again or George just say, no, we're not going to, you want to upset the officials, that's kind of saying we don't care. You know what, you have a contract in place and, and that's it. But this group in the North cares enough to say we're out of fun, and they can do that. So this is a Northern issue. I guess I'll be the guy. I agree with Tony. I want more information, but I don't want it to come back as information and discussion only. No. We're going to keep kicking the dead horse, but it has to come back as action because I don't want to hear it again at a meeting without action. You know, you take it. And it I, that, that's exactly what we're doing here. It, it's, we're, we're right. Yeah, nobody, it's nobody really has said it. Bring it back for action. But right now, do it. Right. Well, we don't have. We can't vote on it. So, so, so you just, you just directed it. Exactly. So okay. this is this is a a north only proposal, correct? Well, no. today. today. Hang on. Well, what this this came to us as a discussion for north only. Correct? And I'm just following what Jay. Is that correct? Is yep. North yep. Okay. So what is, so what is the direction to bring this back as an action item? With the digital supporting documents and input from the super <laughs> input superintendent. Yeah. It also looks somebody had talked about surrounding state to case scales. Brand 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 Um yeah, I'd like to see the office discuss it with superintendents, reach back out to Mark Jacoby as far as negotiation, perhaps, in this. I don't like seeing something like, give us this or quit. So see if there's any wiggle room, any negotiation, um, as well as having the office have that discussion with SNOA, because obviously if it's going to affect the North, it very could, could trickle down to this office as well. So... Bringing it back as an action item. I would also ask that Mr. Jackson is included in these conversations. Yeah. 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 Yes. So just uh, just a request, maybe I misunderstand. Like just the why the nine five like integrated that number is coming from. Maybe just like from the understanding this to the price of this more. Why? Um, I, I do, I agree um, that, you know, it's, it's dangerous to see in public comment in this or else kind of situation. And I I do think as soon as we open this door, 
there are, everyone else is doing it, but you're asking for the exact same thing. So I guess we just need to know the financial impact of this and everything else after that, because like we're gonna make this decision. And I'm and I'm very I it breaks my heart that we're having conversations about kids not playing. Right, um, but we need to know exactly. if we make this decision, and everybody else asks, we to impact it. Okay, so um, go ahead, Jake. Just to address, you know, what we do here at the NIA, and, and as far as opinion officials and everything, is minuscule compared to what all of you are paying for officials during the regular season. Um, so that's really apples and oranges as far as the. the the cost effect or on on our bunch. It's it's a scam wallet and, and the people that are in charge of paying the bills for the regular season. This is a big issue. And you know, I mean we just you know we use seven officials in, in football for our playoff games, you know, at, at the higher levels. Um because you know partly because that's kind of where we fall to. Um, better coverage, etc. We want to supply the best product possible out there in a postseason game where we don't have issues uh, that concern officials. You know, he was a bad position. He missed this call. That ball was not caught. It won them the game, and now they're going to the state final. You know what? We got coverage for that kind of stuff, and we haven't had any of those issues. I'm telling you, we have been blessed by our officials taking care of business. And we want to keep it that way. Because once you go sideways and officiating and everybody thinks our officials are horrible, which some will always feel, um, it's 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 a huge deal for me. I mean, 28 years, I know the ebbs and flows of how officiating has gone in this state. And it's at the highest level it's ever been. And, and we're getting older, and that's risky. Um, because that could start going the other way. And we need to make our associations very fearful of that fact and make sure they're doing everything they can to get some younger bodies involved in officiating, even if they're not younger, more than 50, 55 year old people involved uh, that want to officiate. Uh, that's probably the best recruiting, you know, to get, go get more of those people. Um, anyway. That's that's the effect, the budget effect is what I wanted to bring to Colin's attention. Yeah, it's not a huge deal for our books, but it is for our member schools as they pay regular season fees out to officials and space officials. Right. It's it's an impact across the board, right? Yeah. But I think like for our purposes, let's look at the NIA impact. And right. And it's still significant. Yeah. Um, but then yeah, I mean just like High school like mine has to bow issue, you know, etc. Like okay, so we're gonna close this up. Donnie, I would like for you to recap as to what is going to be done on behalf of the NIAA and what will come back. All right. So guys from the staff, we will I will visit the superintendents and get input on May 2nd. We will bring back additional information from Surrounding states, and I realize some just a, just a note some surrounding states do not have a statewide football fee schedule. They have leagues and within sections in a neighboring state that negotiate their own fees. So I, that's a little bit of an odd one, but I'll do the best I can to with the states that have some similar structures are bring that back. And then the action I as of right now is a Northern Nevada Football Officials Association pay increase, which makes things very odd. Um, but I that's what I that's what I have it as right now. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna say publicly that that's odd. I don't know what happens to them with SNOA and any NOA and CNSO. I, I I don't know. So, but that's what I have as of today on. Does that sound okay? We're good. Correct. Do we need to take a break? That's I will good. make one final comment. I will do everything within my power to bring this. Issue to a fitting tidy end at our commissioner's meeting in May, uh, to where everybody is somehow on the same page. Because I don't want to see what Donnie just said, you know, one point. I'm just, you know, I'm looking out for the, the matter at hand 
And we're going to do everything we can at that commissioner's meeting to make it right. Um, that's kind of how I would like to go out. You know what? We solve this one as we want. I don't know if I'll be successful, but uh, we got a lot of good people involved with officials across the state. They're pretty reasonable. You know what? Let's do this. We'll have that. We'll have that for the June board. Okay, last comment would be wrong. And then, again, I think the learning curve statewide for associations would be please remember that school budgets are determined in the spring of the uh, of the uh, year before that school year starts. So my budget for 24, 25 is going to be determined by my district by the middle of April. So under, understand that as we move forward and that's for any other organizations and officials, associations and all of that when we're asking for pay increases, especially when you're asking for that in the next season. Right. Okay, at this time, we're going to take a 10 minute break. So please return at 10 20. Thank you. Yeah.
agenda item number 26 on page 188. All right, thank you, President Suarez. I also the staff, the dates that we're proposing for next year's board meeting schedule are reflective of this year's schedules. And also the idea now that we are shifting on a regular basis to Tuesday and Wednesday, which we did for this meeting, right? We shifted off of Wednesday, Thursday to now go Tuesday and Wednesday. So fall, winter, spring, summer dates proposed for the next academic slash athletic year 24-25. And again, we know we're going to finish this year on June 4th and 5th, I believe, is our, is our plan for the summer meeting. But anyway, that, that's it is the 24-25. It's good for everybody. We need a motion to approve them. Second, <clears throat> follow the question. We'll move on. I'll wait for the motion uh, to approve the NMA double A board for meeting days for 2024 2025 A, B, C, and D. Thank you, Brian. I second the motion. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. Any additional comments, questions? Yes, Kim. Isn't that during CCSD spring break? When? The March. So I was trying to look for a big book. Oh. Yes. yes, yes, it is. It is. So your spring break switched then? Because this again, this is we don't like this other here. So we didn't. We thought we were after spring break. Oh. All right. Well, great catch. <laughs> I was like trying to hurry. Hurry, Bill. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Wade first. So the first Wade. Uh, just a question. Um, so our next June meeting in 2024 is. The fifth and the sixth, or the fourth and the fifth. Fourth and the fifth, shifting into Tuesday. Right now, it's late. It's listed for the because I got fifth and the sixth. I did. I did. Fifth and sixth. Yeah. Is that Wednesday, Thursday? That's a Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. Unless, unless not after that. Okay. It's not that same fifth and sixth. Yeah. That's not on the agenda, so it's not that. So then it's September. We're moving to the Tuesday and Wednesday moving forward from the September meetings. Okay. Yes. okay, right. That, yeah, that's not the agenda switch. Fifth and sixth, the fourth, fifth, that's not the okay, right. So, fifth and sixth, okay, come up. Thank you. I know it's not this item. So, right, so we need to solve then uh, the March meeting date, which my, my recommendation would be then, since that was supposed to be after CCSD spring break. Now it is on because the spring break shifted. It would be then to maybe go a week earlier in March. But I don't want to get on the Washington County spring break or anybody else's spring break. It would be later in March. Hey, I'm hey, I'm I have Ellen. Sorry, but it'll be just real quick. Ellen Townsend officials day is on. I think Washoe County and Clark County that first week they're identical. Or March. March. Twenty twenty five. Twenty twenty five. Because I looked at official appreciation weeks trying to schedule it, and then I think then the following week Washoe County has their second week. We're not always the same week every year. Yeah, it just happened to be, ironically, Absolutely. the very first week for Washoe County and Clark County is identical. If I read, if I read the calendars correctly. Thank you. So what day do we change it then to? Wait, hang on, let me get it. Well, I just want to be quite aware we have a motion in the second. Mm -hmm. So like the no, I mean, to retract that to have the discussion about changing it or the yeah. I'll be able to amend it. Even amend it. Okay. Yeah. So we're in discussion right now before that. So we're, yeah, we're, we're good. Clark. I would caution about moving earlier on the spring dates, given the time of the realignment committee would need to finalize the realignment. The state basketball, I mean, one that will be off a quick turnaround to have the placement and the field to the new talent. I know we're going to be attention to that point. We were still in discussion, we have a motion, we can withdraw that motion, but let's we can, within that, I still think we can. Discuss that March 18th, 19th date, 2025, as of currently, then not being a, a date that's worth all with their own seat for my motion. Well, on the other dates, I think it's a good question. Good catch, man. Okay, so, so we're off of the Okay, so now we're working on that spring date. Right, the song you're looking at CCSD. Ron, do you have the ability to check on? Washoe, 
Washo says spring break is the 17th through the 28th for the 24th. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We have two weeks. We have two weeks. Yeah. Thank you. Just cautious. I was just going to say, I was just checking the calendars right there for, and it just does say spring break begins end of the day, March 14th. So it is 17th through the 21st. Well, so thank you very much. Yeah. It's time. 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 It's going to be in the 20th. Uh, 17th is the Monday, the 28th. Okay. And diagnosis from the staff here in Easter is late in 2025. I think that gives us the opportunity then to switch this core meeting to that first week in April, then to also get off of Washington County's breaks. I know a lot of other districts outside of Washington County Park County tend to have spring breaks around the Easter Sunday before or after. So possibly that first weekend, that first week in uh, April, on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever, whatever that ends up being. Uh, April, first, 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 first. That doesn't conflict with any playoffs? No. Maybe, no or, playoffs. Not golf or anything? No. Uh, no. Uh, the first yeah. few Sundays, April 1st, uh, yeah, that should be fine. I'm sorry, I'll play some nice stuff. That should be fine. Well, again, so we can get a real line of committee that can also be uh, Dinosaur staff, Mr. Davis, do you think you would need one of these little care but do you think you need one more week into April, like April 8th and 9th, to help ensure better participation on realignment purposes? I think that's probably impossible to say at this point, so I think we should shoot for April and the, the, the meeting that fits this board best. We'll figure out a way as a realignment committee to, to, to work through that. Better. So again, before a motion to advise from the staff, April 1st or 2nd, or possibly uh, April 8th or 9th. Again, I, that, it's not, I'm not thinking of anything that Mr. Davis just said. I'm just saying that opportunity exists, right? We're still ahead of Easter at that point. At any point through April 1st, 2nd, or April 8th. I think we're probably, probably doing that. Either. I have a motion on the floor of group A, B, and D. Um, will you go ahead and take care of that? And I'll make a motion to do C. We'll have a second. Ray Ann, second. Yeah. Okay, so we have Matt and Ray Ann. And again, this is just for A, B, and D. Yes. Okay, we have, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. I would like to make a motion to approve item C. Uh, for the nine level a board of control meeting dates for April 24 and 25. And then these dates would change to April 1st and 2nd. Thank you. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Yeah. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, let's go to um, page 190, item 28, basketball shot clock. All right, Donnie Nelson from the staff. Again, this is just to clarify, it's not, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not an action item. It's just to uh, remind everybody, I guess, that our, our basketball shot clock, if you look at numbers one through six, explain where we are and what our time frame is. Uh, I, I really want to ask our liaisons if they Heard any conversations within their, their league regions classifications about how schools are progressing, looking ahead towards a full implementation and not next year, so one more year on trial basis, but the year after that, uh, and seeing if anybody's interested in expanding in the trial basis next year. Because I know this year we didn't have a whole lot of that. We had a, a couple of major tournaments out in Las Vegas that used a shot clock. Uh, but anyway, let me start. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Remember, uh, he's on Odegaard. What, where, how, how do you, what are you hearing about 3 a.m.? Uh, Jason on the guard, we have on. We haven't really talked about it a lot, and it hasn't come up too much in our week discussions. Uh, just visit with some coaches. Uh, there isn't, there hasn't really been any opposition to it. I don't know that we, I don't know that our teams had any games this year that they utilize the shot clock. Uh, however, 
all nine company schools will have it for every next next basketball season. Um, I and I think from what I've heard from coaches, I think that they're okay with it and they don't there's no opposition per se. So good signs. Uh Sean Simon's two A liaison. Uh similar to Jason, there hasn't been much opposition at the 2A level. I was, we have two high schools in our school district, uh, Brannigan Valley is 1A and, and us being 2A. And so we were able to talk to our superintendent and secure funds to get those shot clocks installed. Uh, our timeline is possibly this summer, uh, early fall to get them in. Um, the 2A league in itself is, is doing similar things with the understanding that a lot of us are gonna try to get them installed and maybe play around with them a little bit next year, uh, you know, practice time and whatnot. Uh, Brandon Valley does play Lincoln County every year and basketball is a non-league game. That could be something we could look at, talk to the coaches and, and try it for that trial basis. But uh, everybody else that hasn't been too much opposition, uh, we're pretty close to Utah. When we go to Utah tournaments in the summer, I've been playing with it um, where they have it at all levels. I will tell you one concern that Utah told me was – it's uh, they've been sending three officials out to these 1A, 2A schools that normally only pay for two. They pay three officials now. When the state of Utah forced them to pay three officials because one has to keep track of the shot clock, not, not controlling it, but looking and helping with those things. So, something to look at. But I think, like I said, we're we're all in and uh, we think it you know, we should use it. So, Mr. Vick's got about within the 1A about shot clocks. Is there anybody getting ready to? Put it, put it in and get ready to test them next they, year. They, they, the biggest thing with the 1A is um, finance. You know, um, it's a big impact. So we're just waiting to see what's going to happen. Everybody knows it's coming. Uh, everybody knows they have to do it. <laughs> so it will happen. And, and Smith, we hope to do it this summer. All right. Now uh, we'll go back to charter school practice please. on just uh Mr. Fact, do pretend so I can get everybody aware of right because this is no strike. Okay. Right. Uh, Mr. Hammond, charter school, how are we doing? Um I know I find Chris Keaton, so our shop box just got delivered on Monday. So we've already ordered them and we're just waiting for install for them. I know uh some charter schools are you know, like they want them. They, they think it would be great for the game, but it is, you know, coaches would say that, um, but it all comes to cost. And we, frankly, we got to be paid 13000 to have our shot clocks uh, to have them, but then also to have them installed professionally. So that's just, that's just a cost that a lot of schools are looking at. I know, so Kay was talking about, they had like an LED scoreboard there installed and hopefully they can have like something on their LED scoreboard will have like, hey, we'll just put up the shot clock on there. So that's just a thing trying to save money there for them. So a lot of it, it just going to come down to a cost. Mr. Rivera, private school side. Mando Rivera, private school is on. Um, we use them for our tournaments. Yeah. Um, so it's uh it's not doesn't change the game very much um other than the end of the games and end of quarters where you're forced to make a play you can't hold it for the last minute you can't be ahead by 15 points and start holding the ball in five minutes and you know so it it keeps the game sped up um but the style of play that majority of las vegas plays is up and down so the shot clock doesn't really come into play too often, you know, that we've noticed. Um, and then the teams from out of town that don't have shot clocks, they come from states that don't have shot clocks, they get accustomed really quickly because the style of play is still the style that they're still balls and going fast. And stuff. Um, what I caution all of you about, because this is our second edition of shot clocks, is PE classes. They don't care about shot clocks. They kick balls, they throw uh, equipment at them, they throw the basketball off trying to be cute. They do not care about the shot clocks that are in your gym. So you really have to be mindful of your teacher to not allow things like that to happen because 
we got them and we installed them and we started the school for events just in case. And then they were destroyed just by PE classes, just by the balls hitting them, screws to pop out eventually, like it's. So that's what your worry is. And then when you're talking about on that board, you have to have them on both sides. So if you don't have LED boards on both sides, then you still would have to have a shot clock on the other side. So you have to worry, be mindful of that stuff as well. It's tough because they have to be mounted high enough by the NFHS standards. They can't be on the floor because then you have to worry about people getting burned so they have to be mounted high enough. And so there's a lot to go into it. Uh, private schools are all, all in for it from what my discussions have been. They're ready for to have it and to be consistent with it because um, a lot of them play in our tournament. They enjoyed it when they had the tournament. Um, we have some public schools we played in our non league schedule that we used during those in the preseason games. And there's no effect on the stock on the game, um, but it is an incentive for your team to defend only for 35 seconds. It's a big difference. When you, uh, <clears throat> you're using it now to turn this and stuff, who's working that clock? Uh, we have the, the, so the tournaments, we have, in season we have the SNLA people. Okay, so then you pay for it, uh, an additional official to run that shot clock? Not necessarily. Okay. Depends on which SNA people we have. <laughs> so we have a standard group that we usually have, Okay, and they don't need the extra person. Okay. Um, if they did, we would pay a kid. Okay. So because pay a kid or... cause it's just a, it's two buttons. You leave it on, you click hand click it on, and then reset it. Yeah, hand click it on, and that's it. So it's not rocket science because yeah. the the people that are regular SNA people, they can do that with one hand and one third of the other yes. stuff because it doesn't change it. Thank you. That's what you expect there. Uh, Ms. Hebig, I realize you represent schools that are private schools, charter schools, public schools, and I'm going to turn it over to President Sloan here in a second. Is there anything you want to say or do we just turn it over to President You can turn it over there because for CCSD, yeah, they're taking care of it. I'll just let you know that uh, our schools are aware. We've brought it up in a couple of our athletic administrators' meetings. Our district is currently creating our RFP. Uh, hopefully, it should be finalized soon. And our goal is to have it in place by next season. I'd like it in every school by the end of the summer, but but it depends on their RFP and what's going to be we can get it out. And uh, Vice President Stallworth, uh, Mr. Levin is not with us today. Uh, I, I understand, like, you know, she's on the phone. Oh, sorry. Bye, Bob. Bob, hey, how are we doing? And uh, tell us what's going on within uh, 45A Northern with basketball shot clocks and everybody's knowledge of getting ready. And then I'll turn it over to Mr. Stallworth. Okay, uh, Donnie, can you, can you hear me? I'm not sure. My audio has been kind yes. of. Yeah, thanks, so Bob. Done. All right, good. Yep. So I met with the athletic directors up here on Monday of this week, and the topic did come up. And um, the message that I heard, as as I don't really work in the district anymore, but um, that the Washoe County School District, and Rollins can probably add on to this, is going to pay. So they've determined how they're going to pay for the shot clocks at the Washoe County Schools uh, as a part of our league. And then, and then Carson Douglas and Bishop Minogue would obviously be on their own, but the Washoe County School District is going to pay for shot clocks for um, for the schools up here um, with the caveat that uh, if they want it any earlier than they have to have it, they've got to pay for it themselves. So you won't see shot clocks uh, in any of the schools up here with respect to the Washoe County schools before it's mandated and they have to have them according to the NIAA. So that's kind of where they are this year. That's the message I heard on Monday. All right. Thank you. Is there anybody saying they were going to, they wanted them earlier and, and so they were going to incur the expense themselves to make that happen? All right. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Stoll, wrap it up. Um, one of the biggest problems, hurdles that we're facing is um, the RFP process district wide is a pretty extensive one and schools just can't go out. And, and I think that's one of the problems that we've had is, is that we've had some. Schools go a little rogue and just start contacting a company from New Zealand or 
Venezuela or whatever, trying to get something done. And that's just not the process uh, that we have to go through. So the art process is, is the paperwork is in, uh, that's being done. Um, I don't know how Poppy Army is going to do this because out of our 11 high schools, I think from a, a structural standpoint, I think all 11 are different. So it's not like the company can come and give us a bid that that bid is going to be the same for school. That the bids are, it's kind of being a weird process because they're trying to give us a district quote and a district price, but yet every school is so different that. Um, that price is going to be different from one installation is going to be different from one school to another. So we're kind of doing it individually for school and, and trying to get that all done at the same time. So um, our, we're hoping that we can get some construction and some, some schools done very soon and, and so that our district and teams can at least start the process of playing with the clock before the actual uh, requirement is that we have it in our new game. So we're hoping to have some of those clocks in as early as, as, as next next season. And Roland's right. We, we have probably five, six, seven different systems. Yeah. And we were proactive with a different company where uh, we have we took snapshots of all the backboards, the systems. So we have all that in the data that will also be disseminated in your RFPs. So. Yeah, this is not an easy task, especially if you have multiple schools with multiple systems. All right, wrap it up, Diane Nelson staff, just to pay again attention to items one and numbers one and three there on page, I think it's 191. Uh, number one, varsity level games only 23, 24 to be revisited by the board at a later date for non varsity games in this upcoming 24, 25 season. So when we get to agenda planning items, future meetings, I'll make sure that's on there just that the board needs to say that we want to allow the option for sub varsity games or not. Doesn't have to, but that needs to be clarified. And then just a note again, a note on number three if you talk about trainings and who's going to run these shot clocks, again, the minimum standard is that the recommendation is that operator be at least 18 years of age, high school graduate. It is permissible, however, that any person who's at least 14 years of age may do it. Again, I know different schools, different districts will work with. Officials, organization, or not, or train people internally, but those are the minimum standards. Just, just to clarify, so I just don't like this Right, and we're good to, good to move on to 29. Okay, now we go to number 29 of page 192. Realignment committee updates uh, for possible action to turn the silver to bar days. Thank you, President Stone Barriers and I staff. A realignment committee met for the first time two weeks ago tomorrow. Um, for our committee members who were new, it was very informative, I hope. For our committee members who've been around for a while, it was an hour and 15 minutes to listen to talk. And interjecting, thankfully, failed in the audience of the legal counsel, Mr. Anderson, also helped explain why we were subject to the open meeting law and what we would need to do as a realignment committee if we wanted to do things that are currently not spelled out in that. And that would include obviously coming to this board for some of those proposals for the taking forward. We are meeting again tomorrow because one can never have enough meeting in a week for those liaisons who are on the table in the department. <laughs> the realignment committee as well. Not bad. We're just trying to get everybody scheduled where we could have as many people there to meet as possible. One of our tasks slash goals for tomorrow is to complete a timeline. For when we will have everything done, we'll bring that back to this board in June. We are also going to discuss everybody's homework, which was to talk to the people that they represent and gather ideas on what they feel that next realignment should include. I can tell from my email that that's been done because there's a lot of it in there. Uh, but we'll discuss tomorrow as well. Going forward, I think we're going to need at least one more meeting where we kick ideas around before we come up with something that we do really want to bring forward to this board in terms of policies and procedures. Uh, I am hopeful that we can bring that back in the June meeting and have that all set and approved. We're really going to take the repulse of the committee tomorrow to see how many more meetings or how. Frequently, we would need to meet 
to try to get that accomplished. Um, Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry, you're like, it's, it's like a wall here. You are back there, thank you. Um, Mr. Jackson is somebody who, along with Commissioner Levin, I'm relying on very heavily in this process because we kind of all did this battle together for, for quite a while. Mr. Jackson did help out too in that meeting with the explanation of kind of how we got here. Mr. Jackson, I have how I and Cole here. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bart. Tim Jackson. Um, I'm at that point, I, I am realignment uh, consultant. Sure. Okay. Um, we did talk about it. We also talked about the fact that this is an opportunity for schools to present new ideas. And when we said new ideas, what we were really pressing on was the terminology and the way we look at leagues and the formation of them, the way we look at different conferences of all that kind of thing. The other thing we wanted to express, express to them was communicate now with your leadership and your coaches. We really want that and pressed upon them greatly. This committee is new, it's diverse, it's a unique situation. But what we don't want is what we've run into in the past over and over again is one month before we're ready to bring it to the board for approval, the brakes are slammed on. So we want to make sure our coaches are aware, our administrators are aware, and our principals are aware so we keep everybody in the loop. I think Bart did a wonderful job of pressing that point to this committee talk. And I can tell you, Bart, I have gotten uh, phone calls from, from the liaison, from the members of that committee asking, who do I go talk to? And I know the track coaches, if I'm not mistaken, I believe cross country and track coaches have already scheduled a meeting to start talking about it. So it's it's filtered all the way down to the, the, the boots on the ground. Our coaches are already starting to talk to me about what they want to do. Baseball coaches, I believe, also have met as well. So it's starting to get out there. So I'm very happy with that. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. From our office, I'm designing something that is taking up hours of my time that changes the rubric a little bit to try to get a more accurate measure when we use a rubric, it's going to quite possibly turn into a very wide ranking, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details of that because it's going to take forever. But I want to try to have a more accurate measurement of team A and team B, of we really putting them in the right spot. We are also kicking around the ideas, as Mr. Jackson said, that maybe we don't make your finish in the lead determine where you're at necessarily in the playoffs. You may not have to be in a lead with even though they're all in the same class as you. So that when we have some of these disparities where a team was placed in 5A because of their last two years of success and they want all those teams, maybe they can be in a league that's more comfortable to them. We hear all the time about geographic rivalries have been lost through some of this. Well, maybe we can put you in a league with your geographic rivals. Only one of them's 3A, one of them's 4A, one of them's 5A. A lot of change, it's a short period of time, and that's why we're going to need a couple of these discussions to go on. I've been how baseball games, softball games, volleyball, trying to get to some of these people to look, what do you think? It's, it's a process of a short period of time, but it's an important one. And again, the liaisons around the border are, are very giving of their time right now. And I appreciate that more than they know. Uh, Mr. Stahl, you have a question. Yes. I want to start with the board. Um, is there a site uh, on the NIAA website that they can, a link that they can go to to express some ideas or to provide information? Or is there, I don't think that the information is getting out to our, our coaches that well in the door. And I think that I want to try to help and assist in terms of providing at least some updates of what's going on and or um, at least sending them some information to our athletic directors to give to their coaches of who they can contact or send information to that's on the committee to discuss. I still have people contacting me about what's going on with realignment. I'm not on the committee anymore. 
So if I could just have, or there should be some information going out, I can send out that would really help my office out. Ms. Lawson, are you going to address that? Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Lawson. I think that you can do that in the final form. Okay. You can contact all of the images. I can show you what's all that. Thank you. And anybody with any of those ideas on I'm sorry, you're checking the email right now. You can email me with that to disseminate the committee as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've had, I've been contacted by, um, uh, a lot of football coaches um, that were in the 5A2, 5A3 about the movement of, uh, and I'm, I think you alluded to it, um, they have a strong class of seniors and juniors, and then they do real well, and then all of a sudden they get kicked up. So they were talking how they would like to have a longer period or three year between versus two years. Anyway, then just to bring that up that they've contacted I've had conversations with head coaches on that result. Thank you. Appreciate it. it was just football. Thank you. I'm sorry for stepping on you there. Well that's the one thing about this next cycle too is it's going to be three years. Now we've spelled out on that it's two years, but we've got to get back on a cycle where we're not Sitting right on top of the state legislature when they meet, because that was a catastrophe for Mr. Anderson, Mr. Nelson, the last, the last little week. What you see on your agenda also is for possible action in this. And the one thing that I would ask this board for action on we have had a member of the realignment committee. We are, we are really asking to be AD principals, athletic administrators, people like that. One member of our realignment committee, Bill Mollett, at his school, uh, the athletic administrator at that school filled in for him at the first meeting. She's also filling in tomorrow. But if that's not something she wants to do long term, we would need to replace that under the committee. Our committee is going to meet more frequently with this board. And I would ask, and I think we did this in the last go around too, Mr. Anderson. Yeah. If you uh, wouldn't mind correcting me if I'm wrong or saying I'm correct on this, we asked this board for permission to replace somebody on the committee. Our staff would take care of that. We'd come back at the next board meeting then for your approval. To, to confirm it. Yeah, to confirm it. That's, that's what we think. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Wait, I'm at. Well, I would move for approval for the final replacement for the realignment committee. Does that have to go to vote? Even though we. Yeah, he had that for, for action. Yeah, that is The realignment committee. Okay, so. Okay. All right, we have a motion and we have a second. Any further discussion, questions? Carry none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any, any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we can go to agenda item number 30 on page 193 schools dropping programs uh, for information discussion. Bart Davis. Because the song Bart Davis and I staff on pages 194, 195, 196 of your package, which is far what we know of schools that were aligned, folks that were going to have a host program and then did not either have the program or drop the program due to the season for whatever reason. We saw that they listed them all. Winter was a much shorter list. Uh, the last go around, there's been one more change in that list. We weren't certain in our winter meeting if small candy would end up having girls bowling. It turned out they did not. So they are on that list. Spring, as of right now, it's pretty light like game softball, not into baseball. Obviously, we struggle with some of those one eight schools to, to know if they're going to have nine, a couple of backups or not. Those are the ones that have been coming. Everyone has a girls' golf program. I don't. I don't know of anybody who we've aligned 
end of the law that's given us information yet if they have to ask for But that would come back to this board in June if they are unable to finish the season. And at this point, um, President Sloan, they, they may have zero. My question to you, do we have any schools that that uh, that do not have a boys girls program in a season that would they just have one? Yeah. Can you tell me those schools? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure I can tell you all of them, but obviously the Brady Baptist school would be in the next to mind you just have that long week spring. Uh, I would have to check the numbers on track as that's one that keeps kind of stayed by us the spring score for having a couple of track kids in each year. My next question is, what is the consequence for not providing a, a female program during the same season? That's not something that has been addressed completely in that. They don't need that. That was part of the majority of what you Part of the point we are talking about the rules and regulations, I believe that. We haven't had that. that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask. Mr. Mr. Nell, because that that's been an understanding for a hundred years. So what is what is the consequence for not having a male and female? Because I believe it is addressed in the net. It's worded. Yeah, so, go ahead, go ahead, Sam. I know we'll be talking so about the assignment rank that just went into effect. It was just approved a few weeks ago, but the board approved it the last meeting. Talks about the requirement that you have a big men's uh, boys sport and girls sport every season okay? and if you don't then it talks about the consequence of if you, if you, for instance if you don't have a female program then you can't add a program during the realignment and if you do uh, if you restart that program then you can't sign amendment status yeah you're on independent status automatically so those are the consequences that you built into it try it in the new the new reg. So that's the only consequence. I thought we had talked about sanctioning and independent status in the school. And well, it, it talked about the independent status. Okay. And that's, that's what it was. For about. that particular sport, not the. Right. It, it doesn't punish the entire school for, you know, one sport out of six that you would have to have. Okay, so Liberty Baptist uh, have, has baseball only. They dropped softball, did you say? They've not had softball for some time. Okay, so they're, they don't. The most playing on baseball. Good for them. Good for them. That's all I'm doing. So they don't have a second program. So if they came next year and wanted an independent status, would that be permissible? If they had a program? They have a program to go on independent status as far as I know what we have passed, they would be able to be independent status. Certainly couldn't come in and join a league. Thank you. Totally understand that. If there is no consequence for not having a boys program and girls program, that's what we have preached for years. Years. And, and President Sloan, I know that's built in the NAP for a school coming in. And it's certainly built in the back on the beach. But I, I'm struggling with the number or with any other type of consequences that have been existing in the school. And that's, that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. Rollins? Well, I think we're talking two different things. Existing, existing schools that are already in, then those that are trying to be full fledged members. So those are two different things here. Um, I want to address the new schools coming in is they usually have to come in two sports each season, one male one. They have to go two years of having those six sports, two in each season, complete the season. After those two years are up, then they can become a full member. At any time during those two years that they miss a single sport, and don't fulfill that, mm -hmm. another year is added on. Okay. For the entire for another all year for all, it's my understanding. It should be that they got another year added on in all 
from all those books. I mean, that's how I interpreted that rule. About the new members or a new members. And I mean, so that answers that question, and I think that's in our ratings. So I could, I, and I know I'm going off the deep end, but, I'm sorry, but I could be an a existing member, have a football program, a boys' basketball program, and a baseball program. And, that, and we're okay with that. Oh, I wouldn't say we're okay with that. It's bad at that. Okay. Is that right? It's to me, no. Xavier. Uh, I do want you, uh, to make the board aware that Shane High School, the second year in a row, will not be here to make the boys call. Thank you. So, first up, I recommend it. I want to try this until it's gone. Would you reach out to Shane and make sure they notify? They were made aware, but we will revisit that as well. Thank you. Yes, David. Uh, David, I'm at Charter Liaison. I know I have been speaking with another school about uh, possible trying to join with high school. And uh, something came up about the Big Baptist, but I was explaining that you have to have a boys and girls sport for each sport for each season, not for each sport, for each season. And uh, there, and the thing came up as well, I noticed there's a few minutes in there. That doesn't have that, and they've been in there for big part of like how how can they do that? But I have to have doing that. So I know that's something that probably as a board we have to take a look at. If there are schools out there that do not have a boys and girls sport in each season, because we have new schools saying that you have to do that, but then they can say, well, why can't we do that? And so that's just something that's important, something we have to look at for the future, like putting that into our bylaws that teams have to do that. But I do know that they do have girls that do participate in baseball. So is that a way around it? No. No. Baseball. No. But. Not at all. Yes, they have. So we, we've dealt with this issue a lot for a lot of years before this regulations came. Um, we've always had, if you didn't have it, make sure you establish that you went independent. Yeah. Um, the problem with your rural small schools is take football. Okay, mm -hmm. This year we have two eighth grade boys coming into our high school. We have like 12 girls. So you have that variation a lot. And so you could, it could turn around in the following year, you could have 10 boys that you could be back into the thing to have all of these sports. In your small rural schools, it's an ongoing enrollment issue. You've got schools that have 40 kids that if 30 of them are boys, they're going to cover all of this. Uh, so I think you I think you have different issues with the different leagues, to be real honest. Ours is basically a number side of things and how many boys or how many girls you have in class. You know, and that's all you get to pick from. But I think our regulation, but well, you're not talking about a new school coming right. in. That's no, I'm not talking about, talking existing. about existing schools. So, so existing schools that are already in our association, they have been members, and they drop a single program, then that single program could be independent status for the following year, and it doesn't affect the rest of the school. Right. And their participation. Right. Level. So those are the two different right. aspects that we're dealing with. So, thing about and I think that that's, you know, I mean, the thing that the NIAA and the office needs to make sure that's happening is, is that those schools that are doing that are going back and being dropped back down to independent status when they come back. That's where I think we just need to make sure from an NIAA standpoint that those issues are being addressed with those schools. And conversations are being done. Yes. That's huge. And I'm yes. just going to tell you from a, I have my title nine guy sitting right here. Be very conscientious, especially if you're public, public school, because the last thing you need is OCR knocking on your door because of lack of participation. The, the equity side of it is huge. 
we have been dealing with that uh, for years. And uh, uh, just be, please have that conversation with your schools. You can't just have male dominant and it, it'll bite you. It'll bite them. Jason. I, I think that part of the concern with this issue uh, was brought about because there may be some schools that are not 1A size that have dropped programs and are not fighting to bring them back. So then they offer essentially two programs in one season because that's really all they want to look at. Wait. Yeah, my, my concern with this is we we have a standard to get into the NIAA, right? It's uh, boys and girls sports and the three seasons. So that's the standard to get in. And then as soon as we get in, we drop and we fall down here and we're saying, okay, well, we dropped this or whatever the reasons. There's reasons that, that happens, participation, kids don't want to play that sport, whatever it is. But then we, we stay down here at this level down here. Um, when do what's the incentive to ever get back to the standard that the NIAA set to get into to becoming a member? Um, the alternative, and I've talked to Dave about this, if if a football program drops, there should be an opportunity for that school to say, okay, we're going to pick up cross country, and the kids move into cross country, yeah. and that um, suffices that boys, girls um, requirement for the fall, because cross country is essential sport. What's the avenue to allow a school to kind of um, go between the fall sports, spring sports, winter sports, whatever, they're more individual, such as as if you drop your basketball program and maybe you pick up wrestling. Um, is that an avenue that the NIAA has to be able to maintain that level of filling those sports? I, I don't know, I'm asking the question. Oh, um, yeah. So I, I tell you, I'm looking at the regulation that we just passed, and I think it addresses all this. In the first section, says during a two year period for which schools are classified and aligned, this is our realignment. In a sanctioned sport pursuant to 385B.25O, a school must A, field and maintain at least one varsity team for boys in sanctioned sport in each season of that of the period. B, field and maintain at least one varsity team for girls in the sanctioned sport in each season of the period. And C, satisfy the schedule of the appropriate class for each and league for each varsity team of the school during the period. Then it goes on, it says, number two, if during a two-year period, if during a two-year period where schools are classified in line pursuant to 285B.250, a school does not field or maintain a varsity team for a sanctioned sport that was classified in the line, the school is prohibited from, one, adding an additional varsity team for a sanctioned sport not currently classified in the line for the fall, winter, or spring season, B, reinstating the varsity team for a season of the sanctioned sport during the current period, the current realignment, or C, competing in any postseason contest for the sanctioned sport in the fall, winter, or spring season. So if that doesn't that handle at all, I, I think that takes care of I, I I think I think the issue is is I make an IAA I drop a football program and I'm going to compete for, for basketball state championship year after year after year after year. I'm still good in basketball, but I'm not good in football and I'm not complying to an NIAA standard of having a sanctioned sport in the fall. I think that's where, that's where some of the problems come into is we allow, um, if, if we drop programs, what is the incentive to get the program back up and running for another one? Because our membership is not, uh, uh, my membership in NIAA, it's not jeopardized. So if I drop it, it's just my program has to go independent if I ever bring it back. But where's the incentive to bring it back? So this was a discussion that we had as a board and, and, and a regulation that we approved <laughs> that addresses the issue. And I think the idea was that 
Hey, should the entire school suffer because you didn't write about girls' sport in the fall? Now nobody can compete in the state championship. That, that's that's wrong. We we are here so kids can compete uh, and whatnot. And the idea, if you lose a sport, is hey, you know what? In that sport, you're getting penalized. But the rest of the school is not. Why? Is, and the small schools where they they write all of them have three sport athletes mm -hmm. and whatnot. You know, that's it's a difficult thing, like like Mr. Big said. You, it depends on how many boys you got coming in that year, how many girls. So I think that was the idea here, and I think I think we've addressed it. But if we want to go back and 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 now take schools completely out, we're gonna have to you know re we're gonna have to change the regulation. Yeah, exactly. No, and I, and I appreciate that yeah. and, and, uh, in the conversation, but I absolutely agree with you. The high standards, and we come in. Well, mm -hmm. no, I'm going to do independent status. Blah 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 blah. I'm going to start cross country. I'm going to have two kids, and we'll call it home. You know, so, um, yeah, I'm going to go with him. I think because I, I, it's hard because I hear everyone, and I agree. Like, no small school should get punished for that. But I think we have to be careful what's happening because what's happening is we have charter schools mm -hmm. in Southern Nevada. I don't know that it's hit Northern Nevada yet. Who are literally popping up for one sport they don't care about anything else they're gonna satisfy the requirements and again if we want to let that happen then we let that happen i just know that i think that's where everybody's concern is and i think that's where it's headed is you know i i'm not naming names but there's certain schools that they don't care about the girls they only care about boys one season or vice versa they might only care about the girls one season, they're going to do what they can to get to that level, and then they're just, they're not going to fight to bring back the other sports. They're not going to, and so for every realignment cycle that we have one of those, there are going to be this, they're going to pop up, and then they're going to go away, and they're going to pop up, and they're going to go away. So I think that's, I think that's what everybody's kind of alluding to is what's happening down here. Now, I'm not saying I agree, I don't think we should punish an entire school, no, my my, your, your, my comment to that is this: look, that that's a good point, and and if there's a chronic violator, you know, I don't know how else to to identify right. who it would be, but some that's what it sounds like you're talking about. Yes, <laughs> and I think that's an issue that the realignment committee needs to look at and bring back to the board with a recommendation of, hey, you know, I think that we have to seriously look at the membership of this school. Um, because you know, for two years they haven't complied in three sports and haven't even made an attempt. Um, you know, something like that. But, but that would be, I think, a, a new regulation or a new addition to our. Yeah, let me go to David. Uh, I know it's previous conversations I've had with other coaches and ADs. Uh, what they like about a school that is in a league, and all of a sudden they're like, you know what? It's too tough. Um, we're going to go independent. Or they like drop out the sport and say, hey, we're going to go independent. You know, that doesn't that doesn't hurt them, but actually hurts the leagues. And I'm talking about like the two A, three A leagues, one A leagues, where now we just lost the team. Now we got to scramble the games, where it's hurting the league, the other schools, mm -hmm. but this, but not the school that just said, "Hey, we're going to go independent." And that's four. So we talk about, "Hey, we're not going to hurt like the rest of the team." But that school, that's something we have to look at too. Is saying, "Well, at this." This school says, hey, we're just going to win a pay. We're going to drop out of the league and they turn the other teams in their league. They're not affected by it at all. Like, yeah, we dropped the sport. We don't, it's, it's a thing like we don't care, but it's affecting the other schools. So we got to look at that. And I and I know I've talked to Dallas, I'm like, with uh, baseball, where, oh, yeah, I got a corporate win because it, the team doesn't have enough eligible players. That doesn't. That hurts their players. They're not getting those games. Oh yeah, they get a win, but it doesn't really mean these. They want to compete. They want to play. They got this white baseball team. You know, if they could go zero and twenty-one. You know, if they played all twenty-one games. That'd be better than saying, "Hey, we went one and twenty, but we won that one game because the team had a forfeit." That's not there. So that's another thing to look at. The whole picture there. Right, Tara. Um, I just want to say a few things. I agree with everyone. I understand what we're talking about here. But from my standpoint, coming from one, is like we don't have a ball. And if we were to be taken out of competing, 
that would take away not just my school, that would not only benefit, or, you know, take things away from my school, but my community. Like, basketball, London is such a basketball oriented place. Everyone shows up for basketball. Everyone goes. And the boys made it to state last year and almost made it to state this year. They were really good. And if that takes it away from us, like, people would move away from London, I think. And then we already, we're already too small. Then we would just have no school and things like that. And that's my biggest worry. And I understand the things with the charter schools and things like people violating the goals, but that's not fair to take it away from a little bit school and smaller schools. I mean, I'm not sure Smith Valley has that problem, but other schools that could have that problem. I don't know if there's a way to regulate it so that we could, you know, punish the schools who are doing what's wrong and so <laughs> Small schools. I don't know. That's just my opinion. It was really. Yeah. Just going to be a fun question for you. Okay. Your school. Oh my gosh! In order to satisfy a complete school requirement to have the boys sport and girls sport per season, in order to continue to have basketball as a full season, do you think your boys and girls basketball coaches would say, "We got to keep this going"? Guess what? You got to run cross country because we need sport in the fall. I'm not sure. I really don't know. I, I mean, I think they are very, very passionate about keeping basketball um, there and around. But it really comes down to the students if they would be willing to do that. I think the coaches would try and put something together, but there is just, I don't know, not enough participation and everything else. Like we've done basketball. I've done basketball since I was in first grade. And everybody that I know on my team, they're in first grade. We have worked together for so long, and for it to be like, okay, now we're going cross country. First of all, nobody would want to do it. Second of all, we wouldn't compete at all very well. Like we don't know, we don't know what we're doing in that area. So I think it's possible, but it's, I don't know. I, I can't say. I mean, That's a, and that was meant to be a fun question. <laughs> How much do you really want to play basketball? The regulation were to change to say we got to do this in order to be able to keep it all going. So anyway, that thank, thank you. That was meant to be. Fun. All right, I'm going to go to Matt, then we'll go to Bart, and then I have Dallas. Okay. You know, I agree with what Tammy says, and I'm, I'm just going to say it. I think it's more of a metro area yeah. problem. I really, really do. Nobody's coming to Powell, Nevada's Oasis Academy to play basketball. You know, so it really hurts us rules when these people come and build these teams. I'm afraid the three may never have another shot at a basketball title if these schools in Vegas keep building these teams and these charters. They're getting them, you know, going to these AAU tournaments, seeing these kids when they're in sixth grade and getting these kids and building these teams. You know, where's the equity in them? You know, Allen has what we have, and now they've got a charter school. Now we've lost some of what we have. So it, it's it's a scary situation for us, the 3A rules, 2A rules, um, 1A rules. It, that's where the concern is. And I think they're doing, I think they'll, they'll become a, and then they'll drop this team because, like Tammy said, oh, we don't really care about that. We want to be a boys' basketball team or a girls' basketball team or whatever the case may be. So we do need to address this. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, Clark. Any present song that's already happened. People well, we can sit around this board and turn around long enough. Please don't program my say the program that they had is basically you know basketball type all the volleyball and stuff that they're gonna have. And they're trying to make a book for the telephone and stuff, they weren't getting on the bus and there's nothing that love them. We address what the liaison kind says as well. Part of that punishment for the program, but I believe Mr. Anderson, you kind of put in the language of that. When you go independent status, if you drop the program, you're out that cycle and the next cycle. So, right now, if somebody drops the program, you can look up on the screen right now, I'm your baby. You're out on independent status for the rest of this year, all of next, and each of the next on independent status. So there's a punishment there, but right? I also understand the conversation that if you really never intend to bring that program back, it's not really much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring Dallas up. Thank you. Dallas, 
Dallas Larson, uh, athletic director at Mott Valley High School. I think my my initial concern has been addressed. I think uh, I know of a school that six, six, seven years ago, like before the board, when they were petitioning to come in, I was worried how much of a soccer powerhouse they would be in the 3A. And uh, and so if, if, if they lose a winter program, but they don't care because their fall program is what their 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 kids want to do. I mean, what 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 is the pun? And that's I think that skip sort of been brought up. I, I I didn't think about the one A issue. So if it's a too broad, I could see that hurting one A, and I would not want that to be the case uh, for one A. And I don't know if there's a way to caveat that, but I, I do feel there's a we need to have something that for the school to be incentivized to offer. Uh, uh, and have kids in there. We're, I'll say we, we have 500 kids. We offer every pro program but Bolden. Uh, this is the first year we finally had to drop B boys volleyball. We only have one question for that. But oh, otherwise, we're offering in the fall football, soccer, tennis, cross country, and offering those fields. And so you're telling me a 3A school is just to offer one sport, but not, I mean, so that's where I feel like there needs to be something where these schools are acting, hey, you need to. <laughs> stay a good member in status and in the 3A there needs to be something there we have that thank you absolutely we're going to go fall away and then I got Bob a bit so so my recommendation would be this then you know I don't think we have a specific regulation that would address how you would uh, handle a school that is a continuing violator and maybe what we have to do is just put together a regulation and, and where you know, once a year or whatever, whatever schools, uh, you know, hit that list. Um, we have to come up with a board that's similar to like a level two that we have with a, with, with a student who's seeking to transfer based on a hardship. Um, you know, show your reasons for the last year, two years for, like, you know, do you, do you have legitimate reasons for, for not having to do these things? Um, if you can't do that, then, then, then I think, you know, but what the regulation could indicate is then the board has the power to yank the membership, um, you know, and, and, and just, um, and you got to keep in mind when you're taking away dues and inheritance and associations, but I think if it's that important, then, then that's, that's the way to go. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a rural guy. Always been a rural guy. I'll stay a rural guy. Um, I want to protect the small schools and allow the kids to play. And because that's in a lot of rural areas, that's what they got is sports. And we want to protect that. Um, at the same time, at the same time, that being said, um, we can't create a scenario where we just get into a position where we get schools coming into the small school setting and we just end up focusing on one or two sports because that's not what it's all about. It's about the kids playing, being active and going. And if, if we get into that scenario where we're just focusing on one or two sports, I think we've lost the vision. Um, and, uh, you know, in my high school, we've been as high as 125 kids in the high school in Brannigan Valley to as low as 62. And, um, you know, it's tough getting the kids out to play and do everything. And I'm a track guy and I want them to come run track. And when baseball wants to go play baseball, we tear the kids, you know, who's going to get what and how are they going to do it? But um, there has to be, and if you look at these lists, most of them are 1A, 2A schools. They're the smaller schools, and we're losing enrollment in some areas, and then their enrollment starts to come back, and they come up. There just needs to be a process, as Paul said, there needs to be a process that, that incentivizes the schools to bring those programs back. Because if we just allow them to lay dormant, what good is that? You know, um, because there are going to be kids that are going to come in. Um, the, the, the kids that come and run track for us, they don't play football and they don't play basketball or they don't wrestle. Right. 
they're not doing any sports, but they come and run track because that's the sport that they want to do. So we only get seven to 10 kids, 12 kids every year, but we provide that and there's a cost to it. And that happens because we have those, that's the only outlet that those kids are doing is track. So anyway, I just, that's my concern. No, it's good, good discussion. So going forward, Ms. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob Levitt. I'm so sorry. Yeah, thank you, President Sloan. Uh, Bob Levitt, 4A North. Um, and you can hear me all right, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I may be sticking my nose in somewhere where I shouldn't be, but I, I just, and Bart Davis may be able to help me out with this situation, or maybe Sean Fitzsimons. And the only reason I bring it up was because I became aware of it. And and does this does this get in the way of some of our smaller schools? And, and Bart, the situation I'm talking about is with Wattel High School, and I think maybe they dropped basketball, girls basketball or something like that. And then they tried to bring back and add in volleyball, some situation like that. And they couldn't because of how the regulation is. Um, and so dropped one sport, tried to bring one back because, they, you know, I think they started basketball. Then they lost some players and had to drop midseason or whatever the case may be, or right at the start of the season, drop girls basketball. Then at some point, um, tried to add back another sport and couldn't because of the way the regulation is. And the way it impacts that particular small school is kind of unique. And I think it's problematic in that those kids, they go, oh, I want to play volleyball, but I can't have, my school doesn't have a volleyball team and we can't add a volleyball team till the next cycle. So I'm going to go down the road and play at South Tahoe High School. And, and in talking to Jimmy Pace, the athletic director up there, that's kind of the situation as I understood he faces because when he can't add a new, a different program in place as a girls sport due to the regulation, then he loses the athletes down the road. However, they manage to do that. And there are some right ways that kids can do that. If their parents are working down on the California side of, of the border, they'll, they can enroll their kids at South Tahoe High School or they use somebody else's address and they enroll them down there at South Tahoe High School. So then he loses the athlete altogether and it further per perpetuates the problem that he has. Again, um, I may have that wrong. I think Bart actually talked to Jimmy up there at Wattel about that situation. And I don't know if Sean has had any conversations on behalf of the 2A with Jim, but I just wanted to throw that in there because I think in some cases it can um, inadvertently punish a school that doesn't deserve to be punished. All right, we're going to wrap this up. I'm just going to ask... Uh... Donnie Nelson puts a clothes into this. <laughs> <laughs> well, as uh, Donnie Nelson said, uh, it's a little bit. Ms. Gray Anderson, as our legal counsel, and Ms. Watts has uh, taken over the chair of our Rules Regulations Policies Committee. This is certainly a, a, an NAC to be brought back to that committee and, and devise what, what this group really wants to do about potentially having a school lose full postseason eligibility across the board for all sports if they're not meeting that standard. We want to we want to create, rewrite that regulation and include that or not. I guess I'll leave that, that that's where that's where that wraps up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, this is what I'm going to propose that we have we finish this meeting. We go get lunch, bring it to our table, have a working lunch so we can get through the remainder of the agenda items right now. They're primarily just discussions. Are well, you guys good with that? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's get something to eat and we'll reconvene. Come back to number 30. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
We're good. Yeah. All right, you guys would like to bring the meeting back to order. At this time, we are going to go to agenda item 31 on page 197, Rules and Regulation Policy Committee. This is for information, Lori Lots. Um, so the committee has had a chance to meet five. We kind of over with the regulation of the Hey, well, I cannot tell if you have been in the regulations all the time, but we know them. So we did have to kind of through and see that quickly what the regulation is. Uh, we scheduled another meeting. Unfortunately, it was during spring break. We tried to excuse me, schedule another meeting. During the break, and we're now in the breaks of everybody, so we haven't met a third time. Then putting together some homework for all of the committee members, and maybe the chance to meet, hopefully, with them in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Is there anything else? No. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments that I believe that, that this is one of the, the we did have a meeting scheduled but for some reason it was canceled because we had agreed upon that that when we met in January. Um my concern with this and I'm with, with the rules regulation policy committee I think this is a vital committee. Uh, we have had no progress in years. This is one of those committees that I call her about every meeting. I made the comment that the state legislators are looking at, at our rules and regulations for eligibility and extreme care pollution. And I think, and Paul even made the comment that we need to be proactive because if we're not proactive, then they are going to mandate as we experienced at the last legislation process. We have to be, Lori, we have to be. When we agree to meet, we gotta meet. Yes. And there's a lot of things we have to go over. Uh, we have to talk about the big clearing. I've asked for that for almost a year. We have talked about the definition of a team. I think that's gonna help realignment and new members. I've been asking for a definition of probably close to a year. Uh, we talked about that when we did in June when we approved um, 385 to 54. Uh, again, we talk about team. We have no definition of team, and we need that. And I think that will help smooth a lot of things. It's just frustrating how these committees just linger and, and they die in space and they don't come back. So we have to be proactive, especially in this one. If, when it comes to a lot of things, we have to meet. And if a meeting date is set, we have to abide by it. Any other questions? That's regardless of who can show up and who can absolutely stop and steal. Yeah, because that one meeting that was canceled, we all agreed to that date. So I don't know why it's canceled. <laughs> okay. We will go now to agenda item 32. SP 196.8 update, Lori Lutz. Okay, so starting on page 199, it is the final version of what was passed for SP 196. Um, it has not been updated on the state website yet, so we're still waiting on that. Um, um, everything that's been blue was added, of course. Um, so for the fifth year of participation, uh, created a quick little and very visual, so a quick little you can glance at what um, that part of the regulation is. We have um, the class of 2023, 24, and 25 will be elected by it. The students have to be enrolled in a school in grades 9, 10, 11, or 12 between March 12, 2020, and May 19, 2022. So, we have two more classes that will be affected. 
If they want to apply for that, they have to be credit efficient. The school has to approve the, of their participation. And if they they have to follow all of the eligibility rules. So if they go to a different school, they're subject to the same rules. The second part of that is the focus reporting. So I included a screenshot. I've been working with final forms to have the coaches reporting done through their system. Currently, they have built, uh, I guess, a widget within there that our AGs we can, in, excuse me, can input the data. And so this is a screenshot of what that screen will look like for our AGs. I've been talking to Ms. Groy in President Song's office. Now, where we see a huge influx of students um, that are wanting to go to schools with their coaches, their co coach, coaches at. Um, and we know the next step in this is going to be they want to move in names. So, Nick Roy and I thought we should probably have them include the names. Those that are on the roster, that are on the club team, what are their names and right now? The only people that receive this data with the name with the our office, um, Mr. Shower's office, and President Sloan's office. But that way, the next step will have names. We know it's coming. So we won't see our, like, say, my coach fills this out. I won't see my. Oh, no. If you fill it out, you'll see your school. So we'll be able to see our school, but I won't see it. Correct. Okay. Uh, we're hoping to have, we can implement this widget now with the county. Um, I have the instructions built for the schools to do that. What we're looking at is having it done by two weeks into the season, which would line up with having to have their rosters um, inactivate and the first games of the season. So is, this will actually be sold out completely in the fall. And that falls within the regulations. Yes. And then when you send the course from the South, this is not just for sanction sports, but it's for spirit squad as well. Okay. So let me ask you this, what's the definition of spirit squad? Um, in there, is it at the bottom of page two? Yeah. So, as in the section, a spare class squad includes without limitation any peer, student, dance, drill, prom, or fast talking for the school that is authorized to participate in activity or events pursuant to the NRS. <laughs> That really is going to have to be communicated to students. Yes. Especially the site of the spirit squad. In some schools, you have the athletic administrator that is also over activities. You have some schools where you have a separate activity administrator. And this really, 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 really has to be communicated. This has to be rolled out perfect. Tammy. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming you wrote this. As pursuant to the, is it a, the statute or whatever it came across? Is it coaching or affiliated? Because I know there's a lot Anybody of. Anybody that works with students on the team is required to have to complete this. To have no, this. but I mean, like, where it says, okay, you, you, any of your coaches across country also coach boys cross country. Because I know a lot of high school coaches that own the club team, but they don't coach it because they know that this could be an issue. Really so is it just the coaching? Yeah, it's affiliated. If he's, if he owns the team, he has to say yes. Okay, so, because I just want to make sure that one's clear too, because they're they're going to come back and say that this says coach, and I don't coach. Yeah. So they're affiliated with the club team. <laughs> so you plan to roll this out with them? It should be in the quarter in the fall season. So when the NIAA 
We'll look at the new executive director who's engaged in conversation in the back of the room. So when the NIAA comes and has their 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A meeting statewide, I am going to highly suggest this is preached. This is just this is this is important. This something like this is going to get us in trouble. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're also coaches like Tammy brought up a good point. If I own it, I don't coach. You know, I don't coach, but affiliation is a good Yeah. So, okay. Yes, Colin. Point of clarification We're talking about two different things here. Yes, because there's a document here, the person is talking about um, affiliation when it comes to coaching club versus that layer and then the next 205 is about fifth year senior and I just didn't follow they are both part of the SB 26 okay, so on both those things just yeah. Yeah. yeah and Lori sort of did the reverse she talked about the fifth year okay. first and right year. sorry I, just, I was trying to Kevin was confused so I was trying to like, <laughs> Do we know, uh, Lori? So the seniors that graduated last year in uh, 2023 are eligible to come back this year. Are there any seniors that uh, have elected to do that? We are sure. Or from the state? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Just look for a number to find out how many actually took advantage of it. Ray, do you have a number? I was just curious with Tammy's comment. Do we need to change the verbiage on page 204 so that that question? Like, are any coaches of boys cross country also affiliated yeah. with a cross country club sport? A coach or has an affiliation with that way, there's not that. Yeah, because they can literally come back and be like, I don't coach. <laughs> and they so, find the pull, trust me. <laughs> right. So that's so, we change that word. Yes. Yeah. And we're probably going to have one of them. Okay. Do we go? So the affiliation thing, what is the purpose of that? So I have, I have my soccer coach, coach's club, and then they have. Issues for the other club players that don't make the team or whatever. <clears throat> it's because I don't play for your club, but we have 12 girls from the club she came from, more than the actual girls from his club mm -hmm. on the team. But that's their go to in terms of where there's their complaint is they didn't make the team, but I have more of the other club <clears throat> she came from than his actual club. And that, that's their case, but that's not a case because it's there's evidence that the better players may be. So uh, I'll try to answer that. Um, this bill was a, a a good example of the type of thing that we deal with at the legislature. This came up. We had nothing to do with it. Yeah. It was, who was the who was the, the east, 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 east of the he, he, somebody got his ear and they had an action grind for that reason, you know, that the Jared kid didn't make the high school thing because in their mind he didn't see or she didn't play for the club. Yeah. So now you've got to go through all this reporting. And I think that was one of the questions I think we presented when um when we were down there testifying at times is who's gonna look at this? I mean, you know, who who's enforcing this or who's doing anything, but it doesn't say anything about it, of course, but in the bill about anything about that. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's just, uh, they just, just got to be collected and God knows where it's going to go. Yeah, it just seems like a lot of it over for what are, we, what are we doing? Like, what is the purpose? Yeah. 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 Well, can I also say to you all? Because Anderson says, well, when we testified at the table, it was, what are we going to do with this data also? How do we handle this? Yeah. Like, there's, there's, no, there's no penalty to it. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Or the east or what? West? <laughs> Northwest. <but> Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> now you need to move between the time. Um, so, 
I mean, I, I guess what quantifies it as a club team? Uh, we're, we're unique and we're strong. I mean, if we, for instance, if we have a basketball coach that takes some of our kids to a basketball jam to in the seat during the summer, is that a club? Uh, yeah. Yep. Or is it out of season? Yeah, it's like, uh, Okay. Now, if it was just open gym on your campus and you're not playing any and doing that, that's fine. So, football team goes up to SUU to a summer camp with scrimmage. That's well, no, because that would be that to your summer football program, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. All right, Lord. Um, Jason, it defines out of school activity. So it means an activity that is not associated with the school, including without limitation, a club team or athletic camp or program. So taking a group of the kids to out of state camp was a big club. Section seven. We no, as a club, because we did not use our school uniform as Section 7. So therefore, a, a nationwide approved event that the state doesn't acknowledge for us to go as our school, so we have to go as a, and it's kids that go to our schools, not kids that are outside of school. That is considered a club, is that correct? Because if that's the case, then every kid on our team yeah, yeah. yeah. That's actually very much. Even though it's sanctioned by the NCAA and the college coaches yeah. attend yeah. high schools only, if not, it's supposed to be a student. I just need to make sure I understand. But we do, wait, I, we do allow schools to also school. Right, so I'm done some step. Obviously, we're going to have many case by case basis with this thing. Yeah. We try to interpret it. The, the June scholastic event yeah. by the NFHS has to also approve by our office uh -huh. as a state association. So even though you go as a, talk about sticky, right? Even though you go as a club team, you are still recognized by our association to go as your high right. school yeah, yeah, yeah. team. You don't call it a club team if it's in the out of season, but it is your high school team. Well, that, so that's... indirectly, I don't think that has that falls underneath that. Okay. My interpretation as a What if we don't leave town and we go to Spring Valley, Summer, Jamboree? Well, that's because that's not out of season approved by the NI yeah. specifically. Oh, okay. out of season. So we're all about that. But I just want to make sure I'm going to put all of the information because <laughs> we will participate in events that are in the June scholastic month because that's when you get prepared for said big event where you got to show up and actually look like you practiced and did something. Right. So you have to do those events that are your high school team at a high school with other high school teams in the city, <laughs> but we're considered a club because that, okay, I just want to make Outside sure. of that one, one specific, <laughs> July's class event, whether it be in Arizona or Washington or whatever, outside of that one. Well, that's actually two. Two, okay. There's two weekends in a row. Yeah. The okay. third and the fourth weekend of the month. Normally, the Nevada teams have only gone on the third weekend. Correct. Okay. They've had an individual on the fourth. Okay. However, this year, California has allowed at schools outside of California to attend theirs, which they didn't allow last year. So there'll be two consecutive weekends that are NCAA approved, and that would be that would fall under that category. Right. We're filling up about four of these sheets. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to fill out a lot. I just want to make sure I understand it so I don't mess it up. Exactly. All right, Mr. Anderson. I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, I think the intent. <laughs> It's it's you have to go by what the, the statute says, but the intent I think was to truly track um, coaches and athletes, coaches that were affiliated both with the high school team and a club team, and the athletes that were either affiliated or not affiliated with with one or both. Um, that was the idea, but I agree with you, Domingo. It, it, you get caught up in, in some pretty interesting nuances as a result. And again, I would say, I don't know why we're collecting this other than it says we have to, and it, we just collected it. I don't know who that will ever want to you know, so you just do the best you can. Yeah. Wait. But, yeah. Um, 
The, <laughs> when I spoke with Senator Hammond about this bill several times, um, the intent that he relayed to me was he didn't want to see a club coach that coaches high school demand that the girls play for his team and the high school team together. That was the intent of the whole club thing. So it wasn't a mandatory thing that you have to go play. If you're not playing on my club team, you're not going to play on my high school team. That's That was his intent, trying to eliminate that scenario from a demand upon the kids to have to play for his club team. And then the whole reporting thing come out. And I, uh, as Paul said, it, well, the language says what it says, but that was the intent. And you're, you're right, that, that was the intent. And that and we explained to him yeah. that we yeah. have a regulation right yeah. now in place that says that, and everybody understands it. Yep. Despite that, yeah. push the bill. So. Yeah. Uh, Tammy. Mine's about the. <laughs> That's okay. We're, we're done with that. Okay. Great. Anyway, can we put closure? Yeah. To the right. club. We're done on that one. So we'll just circle back real quick and then we'll get. Watch, just a quick question. Go ahead. Hey, so, because I have a kid who's been asking me about the fifth year, but we can't figure out how they actually apply. Like, if he is credit deficient, he is, did they send an email? Like, how did they? So it's going to be done for activate. Okay. And they'll need to submit a copy of their transcript, a copy of their schedule, because they still have to be enrolled in the two yeah. semester periods. And a letter from the school that they approved can you take it? Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> so for the upcoming year, it's uh, juniors or just seniors or junior seniors? Seniors. Yeah, seniors. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions in regards to that item? Okay. Let's go to item 33, transfer process presentation for information only. Uh, Lori Lux. Okay, so first, I just wanted to go through a couple of the regulations <clears throat> and just kind of touch on them. These are some of the ones that I see the most. The first one is the, the, the main transfer rule, 716, that states if you change schools, you're going to be ineligible for 108 school aids. Also included in 716 is what we refer to as the Oregon rule. It ties directly back to what we were just talking about. So students that were like any sort of instruction from a coach that's at the school they're going to, they're ineligible for 180 school days. Uh, so it's to really put a, a damper on recruiting. Okay. Seven and six, seven months here, of course, is the residency rule. Uh, this one basically says you have to be living in your zone of attendance. And you have to be living with a parent that has primary physical custody in cases of divorce or separation. And it also states that the NIAA will not recognize residential affidavits or temporary guardianships. And that is, they can still apply for the hardship on those. The next one I wanted to talk about is 720. We often refer to this as the roster exception rule. And so this is our regulation that so when a student transfers from schools that share the same zone of attendance, which is usually from public to private, charter, public, any combination of those. Uh, while our public schools have their defined zones of attendance, our charters and private can select from the entire area. And so therefore their zone of attendance encompasses all of the public schools, which is why it is the same zone to same zone. And it states if they were at the previous school for 180 school days or one full school year, 
they're ineligible in any sport their name appeared on a roster. If they did not complete 180 school days at that previous school, they're ineligible in everything. Um, I often, if they are a freshman, sophomore, or junior, uh, will go on to 744 and allow them to apply if they wish for sub varsity eligibility in sports. The next one is 738. Our foreign exchange student, the bill on the website, which is what I have on the screen, has not been updated. It was changed many years ago, well, many, a few years ago, to erase all of the international language of them. So international students are subject to the residency rules just like any other student. Foreign exchange students can gain eligibility um, for a semester or a year, depending on what they're prepared for. Their mm. Lastly, a 744. It says if you're living outside of the school zone, we can grant sub varsity eligible. This is one of the regulations that I really want the community um, to need to look at. Because it does state that if they leave a school after accepting sub varsity eligibility uh, and they don't have a hardship, they can't appeal it. Um, and I mean, and by appeal, I mean, they can't go to a level two. Um, it's one of two regulations that state that. Those are the ones that I work with the most in my decisions. Um, there are regulations that govern um, transfers to and from magnet schools or tech schools, which really affects um, Clark County School District. Uh, it's affecting Washoe County School District with their STEM programs that they're doing. And it's so magnet students serve the penalty on the back end. So if they start at a magnet school and they don't live in the zone, they do get their eligibility. But if they decide they didn't like the program, it wasn't for them, or didn't complete the program left, or picked out, they didn't meet the requirements, they're ineligible for their name school days. So those are the ones that we deal with the most often. And I quickly wanted to show you what I look at when I go through um, a quick um, a transfer. <clears throat> uh, don't worry, it's in the mouse. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we open up a transfer, this is what it looks like for us. Uh, between Washoe County, Clark County, and us, we do color code so that we know different transfers or different peoples for, their, for them to review. The first thing I do, especially for uh, our large school districts, is I look and see where their address is zoned. Um, and I will put a note on the account um, of where it is zoned. I check and see parent and guardian. Do they have two? Do they have one? Do the addresses match? Um, in this case, I would look at this and go, OK, I'm going to be looking for custody information. Uh, we have an enrollment history. So anytime a student is put on a roster, that enrollment history will populate here. And so we will see it on our end that they were on a roster. We can see the date they were added and the date they were removed if they were moved. The tryout checklist here, this is something that um, parents and students go through, they're signing off on the drug alcohol policy, the concussion um, procedures, that you know they're not lying, everything I'm saying is true to the best of their ability. They understand the recruiting is against the regulation, et cetera. <clears throat> the next is the high school check. This is where they answer questions to gauge if they're transfer or not. If there were 11 and we had pared it down to seven, I believe we've gotten rid of some of them based on what they will answer further in. 
All of them will have a guardianship verification. <clears throat> and so under the guardianship verification, they answer when was the first date that you attended the current school you're at? And what's the date that you started your previous school? And ended at your previous school. Your eighth grade completion date, which is comes in very important because they only get eight and seven eight semesters usually. <clears throat> and they verify that you know, your address. Then they get the residency verification. Are you zoned for the school? Yes, you get the next question. Are you on a residential affidavit? <clears throat> and the next question is, you know, if you're not zoned for the school, what school are you zoned for? And as soon as you answer that, the system knows, okay, are you IV? Are you magnet? Are you COSA or variance? It'll ask you that. And if you say COSA variance, it could give adds the sub varsity application. <clears throat> and the parents and students have to enter uh, upload their key proofs of current address. One thing that we've been trying to stress to our schools is make sure it's a complete document. We don't want screenshots, we don't want copies of envelopes, we need complete documents. Um, and at least one of them needs to be verifiable. So when you say current utility bill, and we're talking about a full utility bill that shows the service address, the mailing address, and that everything within the last 30 days. Hey, Lori, I, if, if I may, and for the sake of time, we have to be out of here fairly by one o'clock. Um, I know the liaisons completely understand this, completely understand this, and I think this is not what, and I'm just going to be honest with you, this is not what, what I had asked. Um, that the discussion was that when we talked about the January board of control we requested, why is it taking so long? Okay. Uh, what are the issues that you see? Yeah. Um, and I know that, again, I'm going to go back to Diego. Diego brings that up. We hear that all the time, and I'll be honest with you in my office. How come Kate can run through them so quick and fast? But, you know, it's, and I'm just going to be honest out there. You know, Lori's been, I've heard from Lori in two weeks. So that's what this was supposed to be, not a presentation of that in the regulations. Because trust me, these guys already know. Uh, so again, if you can explain timeline, what type of issues schools aren't doing, uh, maybe they have some questions of you, that's what the intent of this was. Thank you. Um, a lot of the issues that we see are incomplete documents or no documents submitted at all. We will see lengthy documents, and that is oftentimes because the system will only take PDF or date type. If it's any other file type, it'll show up as blank. And so it's often like we'll send them back to schools to and we ask for that information. Um, often what we see a lot on our end, and it's not every school, but we do have several schools that will send a transfer and nothing uploaded, and just they want us to tell them what to need. So when we get those, we also get schools, you know, we'll ask for four things and they'll submit it with one of them, and we have to send it back asking for the other three, and they'll only see one again. And that happens quite a bit. Um, there are many transfers that I will handle two, three, four, five times. So that slows down the process and we have to send it back and forth. Um, <clears throat> As in the NIAA, um, it often takes me quite a while to get through them because I have other duties that I have to take care of as well. So I do find myself working on transfers in the evenings at home. Um, I do try to take days where I can just focus on transfers and try to get through as many as I can. <clears throat> um, many schools have asked that. If send me an email and you haven't heard from me in a couple of days, shoot me a text or call me. Uh, email, I can see why what person was there. I probably need to make the emails because it gets put to the side to take care of the transfers. Or can I ask what else you do besides uh, eligibility? Uh, I also am uh, over final forms. And there are a lot of um, discussions with that. I do help with um, training schools. Um, 
I've been trying to come up with ways to train pools during the summer when there's changes, but I have flown here and not multiple times to go to the school and help them get hands on training. Um, I create the board agendas that can oftentimes take the time. Um, Right now, I, there are a few things that I do. Okay, I like drug and alcohol. I would just probably, for the good of the order, ask that your main focus at this time is on building. Yes, because it has to be. It has to be. That needs to be number one. Um, I don't understand why the board of Janice. I think that would be something that Tia should be doing. But again, that's going to be left up to the new executive director to take a look at the job descriptions. Again, I believe that your main focus, and I think it would eliminate a lot of these issues that schools are having and frustrations of schools, if that was your main focus and not your, you don't do the other, you're, you should start your day with eligibility. That should be the thing. So I don't, do any of you guys have questions of Lori in regards to timeline, Diego? I don't have a question. Let me go it's, start. It's the general statement. And the general statement is, I try to explain to my parents that this is a like a, a credit check, right? She doesn't need to know you, she doesn't want to know you, she doesn't want to die. Your situation isn't special. It's just different than other people's situations. So if I have a file as administrator and I tell the, these parents, if your file has red flags in it and there's not an already an answer given, then your file is going to be on a, just not approved or rejected. So you have to consider this like you're applying for a home loan, you're getting a credit card, you're doing, because you have to be so detailed in your explanation or have the documentation that she turns from page to page and it answers exactly what they ask. Because if they don't, then that causes red flags, which delays your file. So, and, and, I, and that's why I was talking about the training side of it, is because if they, the administrators that are in compliance or whatever, whoever does it for the school, if they can give to the parents and make them understand how important it is to have a complete file. Here are the documents you asked for in their entirety. Here's the email chain or the hard copy, whatever they did, hard copy, email chain, whatever. You take a copy and hand it back to them so they would have access to it again if there was a problem. Then the files wouldn't take as long because then it would be a clean file. She'd be able to open it up and say, it has this, it has this, it has this, turn the page, it has this, it has this, and we'd be able to move on because it met all the requirements that it required. That's where the, the, uh, the lessons or the, the schooling of all the administrators and stuff like that is where I was talking about. Whoever's doing it needs to be so good at their job that they have taught the parent, well, that doesn't work, that doesn't qualify says right here on this, this needs to have this type of documentation in order for this, or it needs to be a complete documentation. So it's, instead of going to her and being rejected, it should be rejected at the school site. Oh, I agree 100%. You know, we we find that we deal with that every day in the, in the, the, because we've gone through the system now instead of paper. Yeah. We did paper, we were more, we were, it was easier actually, to be yeah. honest with you, yeah. why the files of paper, yeah. because administrators did take the time to make sure they had A, B, C, and D. Right. That's not being done at the school. Right. Yeah. But um, I just would really ask, Lori, if you could just respond to emails, get these out sooner, and, you know, and yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Any questions, anything to add to this topic? Jason. Um, it's not all to activate. I just I wanted to go back for a clarification on the Oregon rule. Uh, one of our schools asked me to, to address this. So our understanding is a coach having a club team coaching a kid outside of his zone, correct? And then wanting to come to that coach's school. How does that apply to charter and private school when exactly. there's always the whole state? It's so because nobody's always been so correct. Mm -hmm. always out of yeah, we've had that question. I've actually had that question come up in few yes. times as well. <laughs> I mean, the, dip, the the rule would apply the same, but the difference is is that there's no zone. 
to connect the kid with. But there are cases where it's fairly obvious that if, and, and the only time we find out or I find out is through word of mouth. I mean, the parent will slip in a meeting or a, or whatever. It's like, oh, red light. We have a possible recruiting situation here. Not that kind of thing there. So. so we always look at when the kid was accepted to a program, the kid enrolled, the date of enrollment. Um, we just went through, uh, uh, we dealt within I think three separate situations. We had to roll, we had to use the Oregon rule on some programs because of club programs in that same situation. Phase one clarify that it's the same rule for, for all schools. <clears throat> any other any question any questions, Lori, or anything? Just okay. All right, thank you. All right, let's go to 34. Uh, page 207, Media Credential Process. Clark Davis. Thank you, Urban Silver, News on the Night Staff. As of right now, I know we had this discussion at the last meeting regarding the What we are doing this year is we are credentialing for post season only. Trying to cut down the number of people who are abusing the credentials that we were giving to them at the start of the year. And they weren't actual media, and we're just using them to get into games. Did a situation come up, uh, Mr. Stalwart, at the Morning Durst School of Washoe County, you know, a person who was using or was wearing a credential that had expired, I believe came onto the court and caused a problem as a spectator. Uh, going after a parent said, it's too else was that? Yeah, I told that. That person actually was a member of the media at one of the outlets in Northern Nevada, I'm not going to mention that person's name. He was not issued credential to get plus posts. Uh, having that person up in Northern Nevada or somebody else or wherever, I can't exactly go out and get the credential off him if they get away. One thing I have noticed through this process, kind of the unintended consequence, people are using the expired credentials. To get into games, which means it's not really being checked in the games. And that's an education issue on our end that we need to address. There will be, as of right now, there are no media credentials that are active until we get in the spring season. Media outlets are applying for those. And we run a little bit of our own kind of background check to make sure the battle is good. This is the first year we've done that. In the past, we had gone to that full season media credential. And again, we did see quite a bit of abuse. Unless this board directs me otherwise, I'd like to give this another year to see where we're at, how it applies, to do a better job on our end of educating what we're looking for with people who are admitting people to gain. I had a discussion with this. Hey, baby, the ladies have talked about this when I was out of school not too long ago. And she's correct in something else. She can always try to pass anyway. Who's on their campus? So um, I don't see a ton of certainly not a ton of media that are causing the issue that happened at that Washington County school, but once it's too many. So again, I'd like to give this the fall postseason, winter postseason, the spring postseason. And the reason I say postseason, those are our events, those are the NIAA's events that we're charging admission for. The regular season events. Those are the school's events that they're charging admission for. We are always allowing media to reach out to the school athletic director, athletic administrator, and say, hey, we're coming to cover your game. You save us a seat at the table. Can you let us in? Can you put us in assets? School decision have got at least as far as I'm concerned. It's always been that way from where I came from. And I come from a media back, or to radio and print. I don't know that we, especially when we have situations where people, I'll well, be careful how I say this. People aren't being scrutinized when they come in. There's nothing stopping them from handing that pass to somebody else. You know what I mean? I'd like to minimize the number of possibilities that that happens. One question, Mark. Um, so when you pass it, so 
going forward, passing the media credential will be in the postseason. Um, so if you're in the media, you're pretty much going to cover all of your sports or whatever. Um, so would that be a football postseason and then that kind of those credentials carry through to the spring? Well, what we have right now is we have a fall postseason credential for the fall sports. So okay. we have some outlets that only do football. Okay. Um, and we have a separate winter one and then we have a spring as well. And we have some outlets that, let's say, they only want to cover track. For instance. So that would apply three separate times. And in this particular case, the, the individual at a Washington County School District event basically had a media credential that was given by the NIAA to attend games from the previous year. Oh, yeah. And the school allowed this individual to come in based on just the NIAA media pass to go into the game. Had an issue. Um, and based on the fact that he was brought in on the pass, which was brought up during the investigation, we, the district, applied a penalty to this individual for the remainder of the season, uh, parent of one of the kids on, on the team. So that was a resolution on our part from the district. Yeah, and I think the school took action as well. Yeah, the school took uh, action. Action was appropriate to what I felt like our office felt that it was it was handled very yes. And I don't please this is just a joke. But the individual just wanted to do an interview during the game with somebody. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. Wait a minute, funny thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. It was good. Yeah. Right it up. But it was a little well well handled, well handled matter by the school. Yeah. And by the district being yeah. involved, wrong office. Yeah. Okay, anything else to add to that? All right, let's go to uh, page 208, uh, spring postseason season venues. Thank you, so I'll try to speak through this. We do have one update on this on baseball. We do have another site that is hosting a 5A, 4A state tournament. So we do Bishop Plumman, you liaison with Vera, and I think we can be hosting those too. We're back and forth on those two sites are 5A and 4A. I do have a, a uh, waiting back to hear from the school that will host the 2A sites. Uh, that administrator reached out to me yesterday, I'm uh, sorry, Monday, and said, Can you give me till Thursday? He had been on medical leave. Yeah, certainly. Uh, 3A, 1A, I have since learned that we will not be able to, we will not be able to. <laughs> You and our facility, so we're going to keep for state and high school sites as well. I'm not going to go through and read all this stuff to you. Um, it's a lot, it's there. If you have questions, I'd much rather take those. I will tell you that I have nowhere near where I want to be done. This. But some circumstances change. What is your contingency plan for those schools that don't have baseball softball programs and let's say they qualify? I'm looking at five schools right now that play baseball softball and they don't have a, a field on campus. Our contingency plan on that, first of all, they have the ability to get their field that they normally use. If they cannot obtain a field, they become their own team. And they have to tell them to understand. Would they be the home team? We have in the past, I believe Mr. Nelson, correct me if I'm wrong, they still have been the only team to be opposed to schools. Correct. Thank you. So, right here for baseball, so for state, 5A state, is it normal? 5A, 4A, we can only phase. We go, as we've done in past years down here, because those schools may be involved in the tournaments themselves, I don't want them playing every game. Um, is that the same for softball? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I also see that so, so three, two, and one don't have sites at this two, time. Two is the one I'm holding out of the south that the minister is getting back to me tomorrow just to ensure three and one. We have to go to high school sites again. I hope they're doing our Okay. So over to softball and foreman and faith. Yeah. Two really nice facilities, by the way. Uh, We're very fortunate. State wise, we don't have anything for three, two, and one, or two A's in the same situation as. Correct. And the reason I'm at two is long. We wanted to do with those 
classification of all classifications. But again, it's half both baseball and softball at the same time. And that's something we talked about. I believe Mr. Jackson turned back and never got to be a great atmosphere that was a place like Durango when they had 1A baseball and softball. Got done with one game and ready to go over much. <laughs> Um, I just just looking over the information on page 209, it's really nice that you get to play 5A North regional playoffs at UNR baseball field. But you, okay, you know, that gives me heart. I, I, I do, and I'm, I'm actually, it's an awesome to be my address. It gives me heart. Yep, yep. Uh, a one game final, the finals for the staff. A one game final there on the last day, and the, the, the 5A Northern baseball coaches did an agreement with the Nevada staff and played games there during the regular season uh, over a five week period. They, they purchased a bunch of tickets to be able to do that, um, selling the game in order to get the opportunity to play regular season games there. And then, in return to that, the end result was also having the opportunity to play a one game that they reached the final day game. Uh, again, with the Nevada staff, in essence, giving them a silver. Obviously, we had to pay the workers and our staff, but that's trade off specifically with the Nevada baseball program, but with our 5A baseball teams. Just, we need to be equitable. Because yeah. and it's, that's huge. Yeah. Because it's not fair. Never mind. I just want to say Churchill will lose three A's getting softball and baseball. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I'll hold it. Okay, let's do it. You write that in, write that down. Yeah. Write it down. She's going to do it. She's going to do it. Mr. Kennedy, do it. Yes, John. Uh, I just want to remind you, Bob, are you still with us? A bit? Yeah, I'm here. Shaman Simons to a liaison. Uh, this will go for Bob, Mr. Stahl, with Rollin. Got it. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to have to tell the two A people around the state uh, the EDC is also on May 17th to the 19th. Uh, we ran into that last year when we told, I think, Mr. Strong and some of the three A folks, 1A, 3A was the South. Fortunately, X had a had a hookup for some cheaper rooms, but any 5A teams, 2A throughout the state will be traveling. The rooms will be pretty pricey that weekend. Well, so, we already got it. You got yours? Yeah. Okay. You're on it. Uh, you might need some of it. I'm not going to give you a seven o'clock. So. <laughs> okay. Are you guys ahead of the game? I just thought I'd remind the uh, liaison to work. Thank you. If you don't know what EDC is, you're probably over 40. Wow. And note that it's awesome. We have golf, golf courses set. I'm just chilling. Who knows all that? Yeah, I'm going to make Mr. Nelson. I want to send a thank you out to this thing that I'm going to call this as much as helping us. He wants to be more involved you know, in helping us attain sites for the tournaments, especially down here in South and we're going to that. Do you know the association is also going to be out for those in March? Specifically, um, Coronado, so well, Coach Joe Sawaya down here has been a real, real asset. But this is good that golf has already been predetermined. Uh, do you have tea times? Well, those are just in the packets at this point. Um, I believe I've gotten to all the That is the other thing that some of the some of the Golf Association stuff where they've been able to help us getting some of the tea times so that we don't have that new time for tea. It has discussed. to be early. It's not fair to kids. Exactly. Don't be allowed to. All right, so I'm diving into the back. Any other questions? I would also say that uh, my ask would be, I know we're relying more and more on schools to host. I would ask that, I know what the funding is, what is given, and I know the conversations are always, hey, if they need more workers, more money, just give it to them. 
I think I think I would ask the NIAA to give them more money because I think schools really have to include additional security CSMs. You know, you need game workers, you need bodies. So, you know, the nice of the NIAA just give the money in the upfront and then have to ask because a lot of them are afraid to ask. <laughs> And then my last comment is something that I brought up before that, um, um, Bart, if you could start looking at the schools that are qualifying, if they're like fairly started schools, if you could go look at their facilities to make sure that they can accommodate individuals, you know, this, you know, I don't want to run into the problem we had earlier in the fall. Parents had to sit outside of the gate, watch a game. Um, there wasn't proper accommodations for his, for the visiting team, but just that, that's not good in the eyes of the NIAA. So, so we would do that. Yeah. Any anything else on state playoffs? All right, we're done. We are going to bypass thirty six. We are going to go for thirty seven. Uh, NIAA goals and objectives. I'm going to on page two fifteen. And I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Nelson. Yep, thank you guys. We've got 20 minutes and we are going to be done. So uh, back next time. Third page, 216, and you can be responsive. Uh, Member McNaught and I have had a, a nice dialogue on, on goals and objectives <laughs> and what they would be in, in metrics. And I responded to, uh, to Member McNaught that, you know what, what, what you asked for my responses and on page 216, that would have been a really good interview. But, <laughs> so, and, and I understand that, uh, not speaking for Mr. Jackson, but I, I know, you know, in a, in a 90 or 100 day plan, goals and objectives would be one of his reports. I think he, he mentioned that. So, you know, you can see there, uh, I did not know of any other way to generate metrics other than what I listed in there. I'm not going to read this all to you. You can read through my page. Uh, again, the NI office being different, how we would measure successes by metrics uh clearly different than a school in our district but it's great to read all that in there my, my point is this if anybody has any ideas as to what goals and objectives would be certainly relating to our office uh certainly relating to again to mr jackson i have to be very careful i don't step on what his what his plan is going forward how he's going to report to you but communicate communicate hey can this be a goal and objective for the ni what is that because i haven't figured out otherwise what, what those are based on what metrics are right goals and objectives are one thing about establishing presence and part of the state or an office or this or that. But in terms of, like I said, metrics and measuring by participation numbers, how do you grow that or how do you grow financial revenues, uh, how do you grow partnership monies? At least, at least I've given you the, the thoughts and responses to that. So, matter of not, thank you. And I know we'll continue to engage in some discussions with you. I, I appreciate it. Like I said, that would be a great interview question. <laughs> with that, I have, I have nothing else. Okay. So, any questions? Done. All right, let's go to agenda item number 38, agenda planning item for future meetings. Uh, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, thank you for this. All right, so uh, if, if you do want to write these out, you're welcome to. If not, certainly they'll, they'll appear in minutes. Uh, Mr. Jackson, I'm going to supply you a, a copy with uh, agenda planning items so you know next time. With the meeting being again on Wednesday, Thursday, June 5th and 6th in the Reno area. So other than regular or standing agenda items, and again, in our office staff will create this in advance Mr. Jack has started. So he's not going to be walking in on day one going, oh my gosh, I'm late in creating an agenda for this meeting. That, that's not the plan. So here we go. Uh, first part, both, once you see that associate members who reports, that's for information. Uh, Off-campus postseason sites, tournament rotations, that can be for information discussion. Uh, Mr. Davis will have that. Three great checks, uh, uh, President Sloan, that's something you wanted to see back on here with regards to the current regulation and academic eligibility. But I don't want to put words in your mouth, potentially revising that, but at least evaluating exactly. where, where, where we are in three great checks and grading periods, right? That's, that's one of the same right. that's, one of the grading periods. that's by quarters. Can I ask what association membership report is? That's uh, uh, yeah, yeah, a school, schools and schools and waiting. Okay, that's, yeah. okay, yeah. we tie in somewhere the New member, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's yeah, that would committee. be committee. New member, yeah, yeah, that could be part of that as well. 
Yeah, that can require rules and regulations as well. So note that. All right, uh, facility guide. That's something I'm going to work uh, within our event management guide to try and create some equitable content. We talk about seats, bleacher seating, restrooms, locker room facilities, right? I'll, I'll try and create a section within the event management guide. Uh, that's for information discussion. All right, action item. Uh, my my retirement pay for vacation sick leave. That will have to be on the June uh, 5th, 6th agenda. Uh, so that we have that. That goes through our audit process. That was something that uh, I worked with Mr. Uh, Anderson as well. So we have sick leave, retirement leave, uh, vacation pay, held over. There's within our office policy manual describes how, how all that is laid out and how it's paid out. So, but I'll present you the final numbers uh, for that. For that. Uh, also, Jake, same thing for Mr. Beesmeyer, his retirement pay, vacation, vacation, sick leave, accrual, what, what can be maxed out, what can be maxed out, percentage of, you know, that'll all be explained by June. Uh, for action item, NNTOA, I'm sorry, NNFOA, Northern Football Officials Association pay increase. That'll be for action in June. Obviously, we've got a long way to go with that first. Uh, I'll meet with the superintendents on May 2nd. I'll provide you some data in that meeting, also surrounding states and what they do. Again, we, we talked about that in the previous item. Uh, for information discussion, we'll have a report on Playfly and the partnerships. Uh, again, I'm meeting with them tomorrow to talk about uh, getting data for the seven year progression of. Payout to our association uh, in reference to the two hundred eighty thousand dollars base fee. We'll talk about the amounts per individual partner. Right, that was requested to get, so we had the list of partners in one of our previous agenda items. But what each partner pays, I'll prevent that. Uh, excuse me, present that to you, and then I'll also make any commentary about tomorrow's meeting and goals and objectives for Playfly. What I think they should contribute to our association. Okay, so that's coming as a information discussion. Uh, presentation, we've got a training plan for Activate. Ms. Lance has already alluded to that, how she's going to present that to schools and the whole process. That goes a little bit along with uh, the request from uh, Liaison Rivera about training, right, for schools and making sure they know exactly what is and what's not so we don't hold up the process and send things back and forth. So I know Ms. Lance is going to work on that. She already has to. Uh, action item, basketball shot clocks for sub-varsity games. To allow that or not allow that for sub-varsity, right? We just talked about that. That was something that needed to be addressed Moving towards the 2025 basketball season, which is the only we allow it or not. Uh, action item uh, board rotations and terms, right? We're going to have in, in June, you will see that it will be the last meeting for uh, for three or four board members to rotate off. And I, I guess we got to identify who those people are, notify them in advance, possibly provide districts with notification. So if trustees uh, need to go back and reappoint somebody or reelect somebody, you'll, you'll see that in our office coming out here very soon. Uh, let's see what we got here. We got a return from the LCB with regards to regulations for the sportsmanship, right? That's the ejection penalties, the enhanced penalties, or was it uh, 800 through 832, I believe? Uh, for information, Scott, we've got girls wrestling coming back and request us to list the number of schools that conducted a girls team within their wrestling program and also the number of participants on each of those teams for girls wrestling. So I'll bring that information back to you. Uh, also, from information discussion, um, I'm going to defer to the board president, vice president. That I believe Mr. Jackson was going to come back with a 90 100 day plan. Um, I'll let you dictate if you want that to be an agenda item or not. That, that's something to work with Mr. Jackson. But I haven't noted that that was, a, I believe that was going to be asked. Uh, information discussion, rules, regulations, policy committee update uh, with regards to pre and post game bench clearing, definition of team and numbers, first entry slash one time transfer rules. I know that's something that Ms. Lotz and the uh, that committee are, are, will be working on, so I imagine you'll see an update for that in June. Uh, also, information discussion, uh, sports medicine advisory committee update with regards to SB80 and concussion and our rollout. So again, I'll visit with uh, SMAC in the middle of April, set up that meeting, I'll visit with superintendents on May 2nd, and I'll present to all of you in June, well, it'll be presented to all of you in June, how the rollout will happen for concussion day. Uh, last two things, again, this, this is more of a Mr. Anderson, Ms. Sloan, Mr. Stalworth thing about Tim Jackson's contract, right? I know that'll be needed to be ratified by the board. And finally, possibly as an action item, if, if wanted by Mr. Jackson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Stalworth, Ms. Sloan, a uh, possible consulting month with me to help get Mr. Jackson going as we get through June. But again, that's up to this group if you want to ask me to do that or not. That, uh, but anyway, it's there for me to do that. I just have two, two, uh, two. This just a reminder that we need the wrestling, swim, and track updated for the 24-25 official speed. Okay, yes, and then measures meeting update. Okay, there we go. Yeah. And then also I had asked 
the NIAA to meet with coaches, administrators, ADs in regards to potentially talk about, discuss about a second day um, qualifying for golf. Second day qualifying. Yeah. And by that discussion. And I think that would go through the uh, realignment committee, which are full mass, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that conversation can't wait. I think it's time we start having a conversation. Now. Yeah. Mr. Members, Mr. President, I do have a meeting in the track and schedule. You just have another time today with Mr. Warren and the North and South and Sam and the Lord to kind of get the North and South together so that they start to understand. They're the kind of the go to people. And then we'll, once we kind of and we'll take it down the road. Here's the thing I don't want things to linger. I, 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 We're not going to linger. Yeah. It should be the NIAA we, linger. We, <laughs> we talked about it earlier. We were sitting in the clubhouse call back in the fall. And I just have to get those two myself and the big two. We should get that done. Yeah, I, I just think this is so important for what we experienced in the fall. Absolutely. Just it could easily happen again. And I, and I, I don't want us to lose golf courses. It's not right, please. Yes. Um, problem is, I don't want to be the bad guy, Jay, but I am going to give you some homework before you leave. And is there a way that you could provide the board, at least for the last six years, the increases in pay that our officials have had by sport? Over the last three or four years, as we as we move into this volcano that's coming to us regarding the football uh, situation that we have, I just want to see. You know, I think you need to see hardcore numbers and hardcore lines with regards to what officials have been getting paid over the years, because what's happened to. What I've seen in this is, is that when the football coach officials were the highest paid officials group, they were just happy and dandy where they were. And when the board made the decision to kind of move and equalize the pay as we moved up, now they want to get back and be the, the highest paid. If we can, we need to look at our data to see if that's the case. And if, if we're moving up those others, then should we move football? I, I, I don't know, but we just need to kind of take a look at actually what that number has looked like over the years and what it's going to look like next year when we get the 5% and then the following year we get the 4%. What, what does that look like so we can compare oranges, oranges, apples, and apples? Yeah, I have all that information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Follow up. There's a couple things. On your um, item for play five, so I think Brady was going to be requested to come. Yes, right. right. Okay, I just want to make sure that was on there. Um, the co op for the rules and regulations committee, I didn't hear that, but I thought that was supposed to be something to make sure that's a good conversation and we get an update on that. Yeah. Um, I would like to see uh, at the discretion, obviously, of uh, uh, President Sloan, uh, likes our review or something, a conversation about the liaison account and that, because I really do think we need to. Be true to the activities <laughs> organization and put one of our mouths there and put somebody sitting over here for an ASC. Um, and then lastly, um, and this is probably a little bit for Mr. Jackson as well, but I would like to see or have a conversation about the way in which we present items. In, and maybe we can have some sort of, like a, a, whether it's a standard way we do it, a, a executive summary of an item that includes like a budget impact, things like that would be nice to be able to feel a little more informed on some items and, and maybe like a little organization in the way in which like the artifacts and things are presented to us. So I would just like to have that discussion. Some more clarification. Thank you. Supporting documentation. All right. Anything else? Okay, we'll go to... Okay. 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 Well, yeah. okay. okay. All right. We're going to go to page 218, public comment. Uh, um, item number 39. This time provides an opportunity for citizens to address the board about any matter on, uh, not on the agenda. Items raised during this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon. 
Until notice procedures of the open meeting law has been complied with, should a member of the public wish to speak on a matter not listed on the agenda, it is asked that the said person please complete a public comment card and submit it to the president prior to the opening of this item. A limit of three minutes per person or five minutes for a spokesperson of a particular group may be imposed. It is requested that the comments be directed to the board as a whole. Comments that are determined to be irrelevant, repetitious, offensive, inflammatory, willfully disruptive, or deemed to be personal attack will not be permitted. Uh, I have three cards. Is Mr. Goble here? We'll do him last. He sent in his correspondence. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Or do you want me to share right now? Go so, ahead. Yeah, yeah, no Hi, this is from Jeff Mobile, uh, Mobile Community High School. Hello. Good afternoon, members of the NIAA board. My name is Jeff Tobel. I am the principal of Mobile Community High School. I am the guy who was present at this meeting this morning and was wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> the purpose of this, the purpose of the meeting today is to introduce you to my school and to make a request of you. Global Community High School has been in existence for about 18 years now. We recently moved to a new campus on the site of the old Bishop Gordon High School located at Maryland Parkway in Oki. We have a regulation-sized soccer field with artificial turf, a full-size gymnasium. It is a public school in the Clark County School District that is open to all CCXD students who are new to the of LSD. I've got 250 students and we are growing, the vast majority of my students are refugees. I have students from all over the world, from countries like Ukraine, Syria, Pakistan, the Dominican Republic of Congo, Cuba, and most every country in Central and South America. My students and families have been begging me to advocate for them to bring the NIAA sanctioned sports to my campus. The appetite is huge for soccer and basketball. In regards to soccer, we schedule tournaments on campus with a couple times each year. And I generally get about male eight man soccer teams and one female eight woman soccer team each time we do it. I think it would be more girls if they had more girls teams to compete against. The kids compete during lunch and the final championship game is usually an assembly. So I can very confident I can produce both a male and female soccer team and be very competitive. Many of my students also love basketball. We have an after school basketball club that generally draws about 25 kids each time. Again, the interest is there. For spring, I can definitely convince these kiddos and maybe others to try out another sport. For the present, my request is simple. I would like to have permission for local community high school to play non-league soccer games for the 24 25 school year as a non-NIAA school. I understand that we would not be allowed to participate in any championship games. We would just like to be able to play some games. In the long run, my vision is to seek a visionary member status of the NIAA for the 25 25 school year and to have a male and female score for each season. Please consider my proposal and thank you for your time. Royal Jet for each of them so well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Joe Orpendorf, uh, in regards to referee abuse, parent suspension, you have three minutes. Thank you. So I'm here representing the State Referee Committee of Nevada today, instead of my normal position that you guys all know me well. So with the State Referee Committee of Nevada, we are part that covers all of U.S. soccer in the state. And one of the things we have noticed recently, two of the events have actually taken place here in Clark County. We had a referee on a field about a month ago who was headbutted by a parent that came onto that field, headbutted in the nose and broke his nose. Put the referee in the hospital for three days. Nevada U Soccer has suspended that parent. This parent actually is of a high school age player on a U15, U16 team, but there is nothing that prevents that parent from now coming to high school events. So we would like to see, as a state referee committee, if there is a way that we can work with the NIAA across our sport, but all sports, that if an organization like Nevada Youth Soccer or the state referee committee suspends a parent from being there for referee abuse or referee violence, that it carries over it that there's no reason for them to, if the county and the leagues won't allow them to be there, there's no reasons for the schools to allow them to be there either. That's my comment on you. 
Do you have the report? Is there a report or anything on there? Um, so with that report, and this is, uh, I should also mention too, with that report, uh, what I will do is I will email Pam's office. I will email her the video clip of it that took place, the parents caught on video cameras. And we would also ask that the same thing happen for coaches, that a coach that is suspended for something along those lines not be allowed to coach for an NIAA sanctioned event. And the reason why we say that as well, too, is the moment that this parent did this action, the coach was on the field next to that parent and told the parent to run away so that the police couldn't get there to identify them. And so... What has gone on with that is that referee was actually an illegal immigrant, was afraid to press charges because he was an illegal immigrant, and because the parent and the and the coach of that said club then made it apparent that they would try to fight them in court because he was an illegal immigrant, and they also offered him $10,000 to go away. So things like that, I think, carry right over to with what we're doing in this room, that it can't happen. That a referee shouldn't have to worry about seeing those parents at a high school field. Thank you, Mr. Reverend. Staying around in the patient gets a public comment today. Thank you. And you have a second one. Second one. This in is just regards for regards to oh. let me finish, please. Yeah. The second one you have here is about travel pay. Travel pay. This is strictly as me as a referee. This is not me repre representing SNOA in any form. This is me as a referee in Southern Nevada. I would ask that the NIAA work with the SNOA Officials Association to please offer travel pay like the rest of the state within Clark County. I can sit in where I live in the Northwest and have to ref in the Southeast and it caused 50 miles to 70 miles round trip. I think it's time that we look at that or at the NIAA make that an agenda item and look at that to include all officials in SNOA be able to be paid travel like every other county. Thank you. All right, as always, everyone, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate you. We conclude the meeting at 117. Would you leave the name plates? I'll come get the list. If you guys want to leave the book clips, or take the paper with you if you can and you have the whole thing. If you don't want it all, just leave it there and I'll read them. Stop. 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 I'll be on the